So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to AOAC International India section presents virtual conference meet on food authenticity and food safety conference. So once again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, because we have everyone joining globally from us because this is AOA. See international, but this is from India section, and I'm your host, uh, Kiran Vaswani. So you all are heartily welcome over here. And we are doing this virtual meet because COVID-19 has uh, spread everywhere, and we are just staying home and staying safe. But thanks to internet and media that we can join us, uh, that can join us over here. So let's uh, begin this uh, beautiful day, beautiful afternoon, and a beautiful evening. Uh, because this is the India section, so we have a very beautiful ritual in India that when we do something, so we remember our almighty God by enlightening the lamp. So let's begin this event, uh, this virtual meet with enlightening the lamp over here. And uh, we have our chief guest, Mr. Arun Singhal, CEO of SSAI over here for uh, the enlightening of lamp. So can we please have the AV? वक्रतुंड महाकाय सूर्यकोटि समप्रभा निर्विग्नम कुरुमेदे सर्वकार्येशु सर्वदा so here we are and we are all set to begin this uh, virtual meet with our uh, even supported by FSSA AI and technical partner aboard. So let's begin this virtual meet over here. And for this, we have the first session that is on recent FSSA AI initiatives, overview, food authenticity and safety, for which we have a speaker, Sri Arun Singhal. So before inviting him on the screen, I would like to tell you something about father. That is Sri Arun Singhal, IAS is Chief Executive Officer, CEO, of Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, FSSAI, Sri Arun Singhal, and IS of UP Kajar, UP87, was working in Ministry of Health and Family Welfare as Special Secretary prior to joining FSSAI. So can you please have the AV? A very good afternoon very good to all the I am glad that the Association of Official Analytical Chemists, AOAC, is organizing this virtual conference on the current topic of food authenticity and safety. And I am happy to be told that the AOAC International, in its 125 years of history, has signed MOUs with only three regulators, FSCCI being one of them, and the other two are USFDA and the Chinese FDA. FSSI as the national food regulator has the major mandate of ensuring food safety and inspiring trust by ensuring availability of safe and wholesome food for human consumption. Technological progress and innovations in food processing have resulted in sourcing products and ingredients without limitations of geographical borders with price and genuineness being the critical factors. The sourcing networks for such materials have become very extensive, making such ingredients or products to be susceptible to fraud. Such kind of food fraud can happen in reference to composition, processing, shelf life, geographical origin, or kind of production practice, with these factors contributing either individually or in combination. In general terms, it can simply be called economically motivated adulteration, 
referring to intentionally mislabeling or modifying to gain financial advantage. Food authenticity in general refers to the genuineness of food, while food integrity indicates the intactness of the food or food products. Although labeling regulations exist across the globe to verify authenticity and origin, incidents across the globe show that such verification processes do not eliminate the error resulting from food fraud that could either be intentional adulteration or unintentional adulteration or even fraudulent practices. It thus becomes important to have a systematic approach to prevent such food frauds rather than addressing or reacting to a specific incident alone. Each stakeholder has a different perspective in terms of addressing the issue of food fraud. Thus traceability, origin, and authentication of food and food products have become emerging issues globally that beg to be addressed both from the domestic as well as the export point of view. As a policy maker and a regulator, FSCCI recognizes that along with the food industry, it requires different levels of tools, varying from analytical methods and rapid tests to guidelines that are easy to follow on the field. These tools can help stakeholders to assess the susceptibility of a product or ingredient to fraud through the production, processing or movement, and in fact, throughout the value chain. To this end, FSCCI has been upgrading its own laboratories in Ghaziabad and Kolkata with state-of-the-art equipment, making them capable of detecting any adulteration across food commodities, establishing the genuineness of commodities, and assessing the integrity of the product throughout the value chain. On the regulation side, FSSCI has also developed and notified standards for some commodities, which also indicate the authenticity of the commodity. For instance, they have recently notified standards of honey, which clearly differentiate adulteration, authenticity, and integrity of the product. Also, FSSCI is working with some startups to develop traceability software and modules which form the basic requirement for authenticating products. Further, I must mention that media attention drawn towards the issue of adulteration or fraud has raised awareness among consumers with more and more consumers desiring to know the credibility of products being sold to them. Therefore, food service establishments, retailers, and the industry should also get voluntarily involved in building consumer confidence. Development of certification schemes to authenticate the integrity of origin, certifying the production practices, followed by a producer, certifying the retailer to bolster the confidence of both the seller and the buyer, are some measures that would help address the issue of authenticity and integrity and combat food fraud or market deception. FSCCI works with partner networks like NetscoFan, NetProFan, associations like AOAC, USP, and AFSTI to address various stakeholder issues and also create awareness among different levels of stakeholders. Adequate funding needs to be provided in order to enable these agencies to systematically monitor the situation, determine the extent of such fraudulent practices, ascertain the feasibility of novel methods to address fraud detection efficiently and to train industry and consumers to know how to detect such frauds. In conclusion, I would like to say that it is time that the industry, the regulatory agencies and consumers accept that food fraud happens and can be rampant in situations where the commodity is devoid of its morphometric features and origin. It is essential that all the FBOs, including suppliers, processors, traders, and consumers, stand in unison to maintain integrity of the trade and shun market disruption of any food. It is also the appropriate time for regulatory agencies to adopt innovative techniques to detect food fraud and also educate the consumers on negative effects of such fraud. I would urge associations like AOAC 
to get involved in educating consumers to make decisions based on scientific evidence. This modality of making choices would contribute towards winning the battle against food fraud and create awareness about food authenticity and integrity, which eventually ensures food safety as well. It would be appropriate that academics, researchers, and policymakers contribute cohesively to build a tangible system to combat food fraud by developing robust systems of food authenticity and integrity. I wish all the best for the conference and would like to receive a summary of the deliberations that could be of help to regulators like FSSAI. I wish all of you a very good and fruitful deliberation ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for this brief information and thank you for being with us, joining us over here. And next, uh, we have over here Mr. Sri Nimash Joshi Ji, President OAC India Section. And uh, we, I would like to introduce him over here as uh, the President, sir, has, is expert in food safety and quality testing arena. Presently working at Waters India Heading food and environment market from April 2017. More than 22 years of experience in market development for the various range of analytical technologies, spectroscopy, chromatography, and mass spectrometry in various applications like pharmaceuticals, petrochemicals, research, cadmicia, food, and environmental markets. Since 2005, key focus on food testing, food safety and quality, food research and environmental testing. Also key member for various capacity building initiatives in food safety area focused on global food trade, food regulations, governing analytical techniques, food safety applications, food quality and food authenticity. Member of MRL, harmonization for pesticide residues and wet drugs, EWG, FSSAI, GOI 2013 to 14. Member Method Review Group, FSSAI, GOI from 2017. Member Global Food Safety Partnership, World Bank from 2016 to 2019. President elected India section of AOAC International from 2018 to 2020. So I would request her on screen now to speak upon AOAC India section 2020 initiatives overview. So can we please have the AV? Good morning to all our dignitaries, our speakers, and all the participant, participants in India and across the world. This conference is attended by participants right from Europe, like UK, Netherlands, Germany, as well as, well as Middle East, India, South Asia, as well as Southeast Asia, like Singapore. So this conference is a truly global conference. So this conference will practically focus on food authenticity and food safety area. And in next few slides, let's have a look at India section of AOAC International's 2020 initiatives, as well as accomplishments. So once again, welcome for the one day virtual conference on food authenticity and food safety. This conference aims to bring together leading academic scientists, research and research scholars to exchange and share their experience and results on all aspects of the food adulteration and food safety and provides a premier interdisciplinary platform for researchers, practitioners, educators to present and discuss the most recent innovations, trends, concerns, as well as practical challenges encountered and solutions adopted in the field of food authenticity and food safety. And the conference focuses around the fighting, uh, around fighting global food crime with analytical chemistry, uh, with an expert on in this area, Dr. Chris Elliott will be delivering this, this talk, followed by Dr. Lalita Gowda, then uh, 
Dr. Bhaskar and a sustainable food safety through the capacity building. This, this, this area of food safety, capacity building talk will be delivered by Dr. Samuel Godfrey and followed by uh, uh, Tom Sipet as well as Dr. Kaushik Banerjee. So apart from this, uh, in this conference, various authorities from AOAC International as well as our technical partners about nutrition, uh, uh, about, uh, the talks from the about nutrition will be delivered in this conference. This conference is supported by Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. In, and this, uh, with this conference, we have a technical partnership with Abbott Nutrition. Now let's look at India. Now let's look at India section of AOAC International. So AOAC, India section of AOAC International has emerged out of responsibility to foster analytical growth in India. We are committed to build the relationship create a professional network with laboratories, organizations, educational institutes. We believe that strengthening India's analytical abilities will help to put India, Indian laboratories on the global map. And we, we basically focus the knowledge exchange program through annual conference, the theme conference, as well as multiple seminars, workshops, as well as we take up the projects like single R validation, multi lab validation. We aim to focus on laboratory capacity building and help increase diversity in analytical science area. So 2020, as everyone knows, so everyone is working remotely. So we are thinking what kind of initiatives, what kind of uh, activities and what we can accomplish during this time. So from, you can say from March to till now, we have various initiatives and ac accomplishments. So India section of AOC International has conducted somewhere around 18 plus webinars focused on various themes like measurement of uncertainty, good quality practices, food authenticity, residues and contaminants, microbiology, et cetera, et cetera. And most of these conference, uh, th these webinars have been uh, uh, have been attended by say for around 100 plus participants on and average and to some of our webinars the participant participants were in the range of 450 to 500 and apart from this we have focused on the training and capacity building in the area of gmos vitamin analysis and understanding the global regulations and we have taken few of the analytical projects basically the single lab validation and multi lab validation. One of the major projects this year, what we are focusing is regulated antibiotics in milk and milk products. This is as per the new FSSI list of regulated antibiotics in milk and milk products. And this SLV and MLV will be focused, uh, uh, will be focused on the SMPR 2018.010. And another project. Uh, what is being in progress is melamine, cinnuric acid, and DCD in milk and milk products. And uh, one project which we have already completed is a multi-element uh, a, a multi-element method, uh, basically for the Indian mat matrices. And this is an extension of the method of 2015.06. And as on today, the SLV is done and uh, we are in the process of conducting multi-lab validation and we have apart from this we have a uh, some kind of a outreach program what we call it as uh, apart from uh, apart from india we are trying to connect with various countries in south asia so uh, either it can be a uh, nepal bhutan uh, bangladesh sri lanka and another key initiative what we are taking is proficiency testing. So the proficiency testing is basically focused that our national lab network will be the best in South Asia, helps us to build the national database and helps exporters 
to get a reliable test certificate and accept it globally. So this is the whole purpose of conducting the proficiency testing and proficiency testing are basically focused on various various target compounds and a mixture of various matrices. Now, I want to quickly I want to, I want to quickly uh, go through the AOAC's food authenticity method program. Although uh, after this, uh, Dr. Palmer Orlandi will uh, Orlandi will throw more light on this, but I will just quickly give a overview on this. So AOAC's food authenticity method program focuses on identifying analytical tools to better allocate and characterize the intentional and economically motivated adulterations of food. The scope and objectives is basically survey the targeted list and the uh, uh, survey the uh, survey the targeted uh, testing scope, then identify methodologies, then analytical gaps and set priority, analytical gaps and set priority for the AOC standards, develop standards for the non-targeted testing and develop acceptance criteria for the non-targeted testing methodologies. So with this quick overview about AOAC India's initiatives and overview of, of the program, I request everyone to really stay tuned till 4 p.m. today as you have a lot of interesting topics a lot of things to gain, a lot of knowledge, gaining activities, then a very, very, very good speakers are there. So please stay tuned till 4 p.m. And just for your quick reference, this is the agenda, what I have put in my last slide. So thank you. Thanks a lot for your time. And have a great learning today. Yes, and thank you for sharing this piece of information with us. And as I mentioned that next we have Dr. Palmer Orlandi over here, Chief Science Officer, AOAC International. And before inviting Dr. Orlandi, I would like to uh, say, uh, to introduce her over here. Dr. Palmer A. Orlandi is the Deputy Executive Director and Chief Science Officer at AOAC International and is responsible for overseeing the AOAC Research Institute, Standards Development Activities and the Proficiency Testing Program. In addition, he handles business development responsibilities to include developing strategic partnerships with the goal of advancing voluntary consensus standards setting activities and strengthening international relations. He has an extensive background in government relations, food science and safety, regulatory affairs and public health in the federal government. Prior joining AOAC International, he served more than 22 years as the US Food and Drug Administrator, most recently as CSO and Research Director in the Office of Food and Veterinary Medicine. So here I would invite her on screen uh, to talk on AOAC International's initiatives, food authenticity and safety. So can we please have the AV of Dr. Palmer Orlandi over here? Greetings, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Gina, the Chief Science Officer and Deputy Executive Director here at AOAC International. And it's a pleasure to be involved in this virtual conference on food authenticity and food safety. To set the stage, I'd like to take the opportunity to discuss the Food Authenticity Methods Program here at AOAC, which is now in its second year. 
using the underlying theme of how consensus standards and official methods of analysis can be used to overcome the challenges facing food authenticity that has a direct bearing on food safety and public health, I'd like to provide a little background and justification for our analytical program, recap some of the accomplishments to date that the program has enjoyed, and then give some insights into where the program is headed. Naturally, I think it's best to start with just a couple of definitions. First off, what is food authenticity? Well, in a nutshell, food authenticity really is the assurance that raw ingredients purchased by the food manufacturer are ac accurately documented. Food authenticity also touches on public confidence. Thank you. And, and food authenticity really is in that regard, the assurance that products purchased by the consumer are safe and reflect the, re the stated quality. The other side of the coin when we talk about food authenticity is economically motivated adulteration. And in this regard, we term EMA as a wide range of deliberate acts, which are designed to misrepresent the authenticity and value of a food product without the purchaser's knowledge or even the manufacturer's knowledge for economic gain of the seller. Some of the adulterations of commodities can be categorized through the addition of non-authentic substances or the removal or replacement of authentic substances, some of which have a severe impact on public health and public safety. So why this focus on food adulteration and food authenticity? Just a quick um, scan of the Discernus food fraud database really answers that question quite well. Just in these top five commodities that range from meats, spices, juices, olive oils, and dairy products, and particularly cow's milk, we see that there are a vast number of instances of recorded adulterations. To combat this and, and to, uh, to ensure that there are watchdogs out there, the, the literature uh, for analytical methods addressing either the adulterated substance or the authenticity of a particular matrix, we have seen over the years an exponential growth in the analytical uh, tools able to address some of the authenticity and fraud needs. Along with this explosion of analytical methods though, come a, an awful lot of challenges, particularly for regulators and manufacturers in gaining pub trust. What are some of these challenges? Well, I listed just six of, of them right here that come to mind. And these are include what are the appropriate methods of choice and what are the performance standards that um, are used to instill confidence in those methods? What about the breadth of apl applicability? The technology that can be used? I touched on this, this fourth one just a little while ago, the disparate performance requirements. Not all of these methods have been either validated or used the same type of performance requirements uh, to fulfill the needs uh, to combat authenticity and to ensure um, the uh, uh, applicability of a particular method. And then to cap it off, there are disparate regulatory requirements globally among regulatory agencies, uh, among uh, participating countries who are uh, watching our watchdogs for uh, EMA worldwide. And then there's the changing environment and the rapidly expanding scope of, of need and the approaches taken for, uh, for food fraud. This brings us to what the role of consensus analytical standards can play in overcoming uh, some of the analytical challenges we just touched on. 
analytical standards serve to document the needs for an analytical method first and foremost, and it provides a detailed description of how that method must perform. It includes method acceptance criteria, and then it is an agreement of all stakeholders and subject matter experts that these standards should form the basis for methods used in a variety of instances. All of this fits the general description of what consensus really means. It is that general agreement. It is a group that is in solidarity to uh, achieve a particular goal. And as many of you are aware who are present and, and listening and participating in this, uh, this virtual conference, it is consensus analytical standards that forms the basis for AOAC and its renown worldwide. One thing that I didn't touch on in, in developing standards is creating this balance of perspectives. And from AOAC's perspective, this is an important tool in creating analytical performance standards, and in this case, to combat food fraud and to guarantee food authenticity. From this perspective, this balance of perspective creates an ability to um, draw consensus from as wide a range a number of of different stakeholders as possible. And this ranges from broad perspectives that include academia, government to include regulatory agencies, industry partners, and other NGOs. There are those with specific uh, perspectives, which include a variety of different uh, industry perspectives, such as from the food and beverage uh, organizations, those who develop reference standards and reference materials, technology providers, and then there are the regional um, stakeholders that encompass the globe. So the next question that we may want to ask ourselves is, how do we go about the process of marrying consensus and performance standards to meet the analytical challenges? As many of you are well aware, AOAC has become renowned for the use of and the development of the SMPR, known as the Standard Method Performance Requirement, publications that list essentially the performance standards that any method must meet uh, to achieve its purpose. What is found in an SMPR? Well, the SMPR essentially is a roadmap that begins with the specific intended use of the method and ends in identifying all those areas that any particular method must be used for. In between, we start with including how the method should be applied, the definitions upon which uh, any method must use, and then the nuts and bolts of the method uh, or the prospective method are the performance requirements and targets that the method must meet. And lastly, the commodities from which the method must be able to uh, uh, serve to detect any particular analyte. In this example, um, this is an SNPR for allergenic targets. Naturally, when we're talking about food authenticity, uh, there are uh, different perspectives on, on targets. Is the target a particular adulterant, uh, whether known or unknown, or is the, is the analyte to be a, addressed actually a commodity to verify that it, its qualities do indeed meet the definition of authentic? Again, encompassing the intended use, the definitions upon which the method developer must um, follow, uh, the performance standards for the particular analytes of note, and then the commodities of, upon which that method needs to perform well. Naturally, AOAC moves beyond the development of the SMPR to use this to adopt official methods of analysis by expert review panels. 
And naturally, both the SNPR that has been adopted and approved by our stakeholders are then published and the changes are, and any status changes are then updated in AO, another AOAC publication, the ILM, the Inside Laboratory Management Magazine. Now, also, a, a lot of you are also aware that really this is just the starting point to meet the analytical challenges. There is naturally, as I just pointed out, the adoption of expert consensus and publications of SNPRs, but that's just the first step. The next subsequent steps that are equally or even more important are the call for methods the review of those methods by expert review panels and the publication and adoption as a first action official method of analysis, principally involving meeting criteria for a single lab validation exercise. Over a period of one or two years, that method is then monitored for its applicability, for its performance, and for its inclusion in a multi-lab study of multiple unknowns and the results of which then are reviewed again for adoption as a final action official method of analysis. Again, those of you who have been uh, aware of AOAC's processes over the year, none of these steps should be foreign to you. So this brings us to the Food Authenticity Methods Program started in, uh, in 2019, the objectives of which were to address the analytical needs for combating international and economically motivated food adulteration. I tried to highlight in an earlier slide the breadth of analytical methods that are now inundating the literature, um, either looking at targeted adulterated uh, analytes or ways to address the authenticity of particular commodities, <clears throat> standards of which are very faint and, and there are very few and far between. That really is the inception of why a food authenticity program within AOAC is extremely important, to create that foundation of performance standards to guard against um, uh, unverifiable performance of methods out there in the literature and to create a, a consensus of what is needed in a variety of commodities and adulterants um, for, uh, for verifying um, authenticity and to guard against um, public health implications in food safety. Our approach is to use SNPR development for targeted testing and non-targeted testing of, uh, of a variety of high priority uh, commodities and to also involve the use of um, emerging molecular method applications to meet the um, other needs that cannot be captured by uh, chemical analysis of some of the uh, high priority uh, matrices. The other um, key to the foundation for our program is not only to develop performance standards for uh, potential methods to meet the needs of both consumers and industry alike, but also to address a need for uh, rapid response in the event of public health threats, uh, some of which we have already seen in the past, particularly with the, uh, um, the emergency surrounding uh, melanin in the uh, late two, the first decade of, of the 2000s. And so one of our other objectives is to look at how we can develop consensus around the guidance document for rapid method development in the event of an emergency. These are the objectives that serve uh, the food authenticity method. I talked about two particular ways to approach the program. These are distinct, but complementary. This involves targeted analysis and non-targeted analysis. And what exactly do we mean when we talk about this? Targeted analysis really is the determination of known molecules a starting point of which we know what that 
adulterant that analyte is. And it in the case of, of targeted, it requires that prior identification of the Naturally, the other side of, of this uh, complementary uh, approach is non-targeted analysis. And the concept is to create a fingerprint for a particular matrices. What are the characteristics that make that commodity authentic? And once that baseline is developed for a particular uh, commodity, compare new areas or new test ingredients to see what the difference of difference, what the degree of difference, excuse me, is um, in that commodity. Now, naturally, there is this continuum of difference. Is the difference small enough that it may raise concerns, but may be attributed to yield, seasonality, region, or is there a large difference? Is there something within that profile that stands out that screams there is an adulterant in this particular commodity? So naturally, non-targeted testing analysis is actually looking for differences based on the definition of what makes that particular commodity authentic. It establishes that true breadth, that scope, um, that, that balance of where authenticity can be assured and non-authentic um, starts. And it highlights the importance of reference materials in establishing what that standard profile must be. This is an inherent challenge in non-targeted testing. We talked about the elements that are important in the uh, development of a standard method performance requirement document. Uh, we then explored a little bit about the nature behind targeted testing and non-targeted testing. Now it's time to bring the two together to show that there are some distinct differences that can be found and, and have been developed in our first six SNPRs to date um, within either targeted testing and non-targeted testing following the, uh, the framework, the SNPR framework. And naturally, from a targeted testing perspective, the applicability is directed against a particularly a particular known and specific analyte. The SMP defines what that targeted analyte is in the matrices of interest, and also then follows that the performance requirements are based upon analytical range, accuracy, reproducibility, and repeatability, and are dependent on um, a known uh, certified reference material uh, or a standard reference material to base their conclusions on. Non-targeted testing, however, uh, is centered on something a little bit different. And that is, to, to use the same word, um, determining that there is something different between an authentic sample and a test sample. And the basis of the performance is being able to define what authentic is for that particular commodity. And naturally, the complexities are going to be even greater on this side um, because any reference material or reference materials used to generate that reference profile have to be agreed upon. And so you can see that even though within the constraint, constraints of uh, what an SNPR is, the approaches and the definitions are going to be different, whether we are talking about uh, call for methods for targeted or non-targeted testing. So in 2019, the Food Authenticity Methods Development Program started uh, with the following priorities. Um, they involved looking at three of the most notable uh, commodities uh, that are susceptible to adulteration. Um, and these include milk, honey, 
and olive oils. And we started from what was known. Now, naturally, each of the, the two working groups that were established, the targeted testing and the non-targeted testing working groups, uh, came at it from different perspectives. For targeted testing, there were a variety of already known adulterants that uh, had affected the authenticity uh, of each of these uh, three commodities. Um, and these things are, are listed on the, on the slides, as you can see below each of the commodities. The next approach for this group, however, was to assess the gaps in current performances of those methods already in place and to determine where uh, consensus needs needed to be found for each of these um, commodities and each of the major recognized adulterants moving forward. From the perspective of the targeted, the non-targeted testing working group, the idea was to take these commodities and determine how best to create a fingerprint, to create that profile of known um, authentic samples, and then begin to see whether the known adulterants could be used as a way to see how those profiles are affected and the limits of detection that would be required or that are possible to pick up these known adulterants within the profile of authentic samples. We did highlight some of the differences in the approaches taken by the targeted testing and non-targeted testing working groups within our program. We also highlighted some of those differences that would be evident within SMPRs that address particular commodities, uh, particular adulterants, um, and what would be needed in a method uh, based on the performance standards found in any SNPR. I also mentioned a little bit earlier on that though targeted testing and non-targeted testing approaches are rather distinct, I also mentioned that they are complementary. And what I'd like to at least highlight in this slide is to show exactly one of, example of how that complementarity would work. Um, and that is starting from a particular profile generated through non-targeted testing that identifies a particular commodity as having something different in it based on the consensus fingerprint. Now, does that non-targeted testing method give some idea of what it might be? And can we glean information from that particular profile and that anomaly um, for which we can then use to either one, identify what that target is, or two, begin to develop a means to extract more information so that we can identify it. And once that target is identified, then generate a new method that targets that particular analyte specifically in that particular matrix. So olive oil, milk products, and honeys were our first commodities. But there are a number of other commodities and adulterants that are just as important. And once laying the groundwork for the six SMPRs, which are now out there uh, and have been approved and are, are in publication, to move forward of which. And in 2020, our advisory panel looked at additional high priority raw materials and finished products and looked into the and are now looking into the categories of botanicals and spices. In addition to those first two working groups for targeted testing and non-targeted testing, we have expanded to create a third working group for molecular and genomic applications to not only stand on its own in ways of identifying adulterants and to verify authenticity, but also to complement the um, performance standards that are largely revolve around analytical uh, chemistry methods to 
to look at adulterations. Those are principally the applications that are envisioned to come from the first six <clears throat> SMPRs. And to serve our third objective in creating guidance documents, we are carrying on work for emergency response and developing a de decision tree to combine the complementary complementary nature of targeted testing and non-targeted testing um, uh, approaches. And lastly, it is intuitively important that to develop the methods either for targeted testing or non-targeted testing or for molecular applications, reference and testing materials are extremely important. This goes back to serving the needs of defining what authentic means. We have already been working with our 2020 Food Authenticity Advisory Panel members. Um, this approach for 2020 was, was fully funded through the generous uh, contributions made by Abbott Nutrition, BioRed, the Coca-Cola Company, Eurofin Scientific, Herbalife, Mars, SGS North America, the Tentamus Group, and Thermo Scientific. We hope to continue with their participation into 2021 and look forward to it. Now, just in closing, what are the benefits to being part of this program? And it's all encompassing in, in those areas that I touched on recently. We provide the consensus performance standard methods for commodities and adulterants alike in defining authenticity and in identifying unknown or known adulterants that jeopardize public health, that jeopardize food safety, and help to combat economically motivated adulteration. I'd like to thank you for allowing me to, uh, to provide some insights into uh, food adulteration from AOAC International. But before I close, I'd like to make sure that everyone is aware of uh, the, the fine contributions we get from our AOAC volunteer leadership, particularly through our volunteer science advisor, Dr. Burke Popping and our three working group chairs, Dr. Joe Boyson, who chairs the targeted analysis uh, working group, uh, Dr. John Spilka, who chairs the non-targeted analysis working group, and the newest addition, Dr. Danielle Soyer, who is chairing our molecular applications working group. With that, I'll close and leave uh, you with uh, a slide for contact information if you have any questions about the AOAC program. And I'd like to thank you very much and good day. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Palmolengi, for being with us and sharing this piece of information. And going ahead and now, uh, I would like to invite over here Ms. Peggy Manson, Director at Large Board of Directors, AOAC International. And uh, I would like to tell something about Peggy that is, Peggy has global responsibility for food safety and emerging issues, product nutritional and analytical chemistry, external engagement, knowledge management, and the life cycle management system with R&D. Her role includes overseeing a team of 70 plus scientists and program managers. Peggy and her team are strong advocates for endorsement of globally harmonized fit for purpose standard methods. She is on the board of directors for AOAC International where she works closely to support this mission. Peggy is also on the board of directors for Columbus Council of World Affairs and chairs the Abbott Nutrition, Food Safety and Security Landscape Program. Prior to her current role, Peggy had multiple director roles within R&D, quality assurance and supply chain. Most recently, Peggy was director, global commercial QA services, leading document control, labeling operations and commercial QA. She also was director for the Global Program Management Office with regional teams in China, Dubai, Europe, India, Singapore, and the United States, responsible for commercial innovation, new product launches. 
Prior to joining a board, she obtained a bachelor's degree in medical technology from the University of St. Francis. So now I would like to invite Ms. Peggy Manson to speak on AOAC's role in supporting nutritional product industry on food safety. Can you please have the AV? I'm Peggy Manson and I'm Director of Global Analytical and Food Safety at Abbott Nutrition. My team is located primarily in Columbus, Ohio, USA and comprised of analytical experts whose mission is developing, validating, and transferring fit-for-purpose test methods that ensure the quality and safety of our products. This includes chemistry, microbiology, allergens, food chemistry, and product attributes for desired user experience. AOAC International and the AOAC India section have been great partners in helping Abbott achieve this mission. And that's why we're pleased to be sponsoring today's Food Authenticity and Food Safety Conference. While we wish it was in person, we can appreciate the need to do this virtually and do look forward to a successful meeting and valuable exchange of food safety expertise. I would like to cover three topics. First, I'll give you a brief company overview to familiarize you with our business and products and why food safety is a critical component of our quality system. Next, I'll provide an overview and update on AOAC's stakeholder panel on infant formula and adult nutritionals. And lastly, I'll tell you about several of Abbott's food safety partnerships with AOAC International and the AOAC India section. Abbott is a global healthcare leader that helps people live more fully at all stages of life. We are more than 100,000 people around the world, and we've been in business for more than 130 years. We serve people in more than 160 countries with a portfolio of life-changing technologies that spans the spectrum of healthcare. We have been leading businesses in products and medical devices, diagnostics, nutritionals, and branded generics medicines in emerging markets, generating sales in excess of $30 billion. And we have market leading positions in every one of these businesses. I'll mention a few of them. Abbott is number one in remote heart failure monitoring, heart pumps, point of care testing, adult nutrition, and pediatric nutrition, excuse me, nutrition in the US. Good, nutri good nutrition is essential to our health and wellness. From infants to the elderly, Abbott offers science-based nutrition and rehydration products to help make every stage of life a healthy one. People rely on Abbott's products in the most important ways, and that's a responsibility we take very seriously. Abbott people understand the impact of their work and the impact our products have. As a result, we strive every day to do the right thing in the right ways and we hold each of our suppliers to these same high standards. Although ensuring accurate nutrient levels in food products would not be considered food safety in the traditional sense, when it comes to infant formula and therapeutic nutritionals, we believe it's just as critical as verifying the absence of contaminants. One way AOAC has been able to help Abbott Nutrition and the infant formula industry achieve high quality standards for nutrient testing is through the stakeholder panel in infant formula and adult nutritionals. This figure illustrates the key components of AOAC's model for advancing the development, validation, and implementation of test methods for food safety. The model is exemplified by the success of SPIPAN, which launched in 2010 to modernize and validate robust, fit for purpose nutrient methods for infant formula. Demand for SPIPAN was driven primarily by the infant formula industry because of the complexity of formulas have evolved beyond capabilities of the existing test methods. Additionally, regulatory challenges between the infant formula companies and country authorities suggested a need for harmonized test methods. Since its inception, SPIPAN has approved analysis for 50 nutrients and established 34 standards of how those methods should be validated. To help encourage labs to implement SPIFAN methods and ensure they're run properly, AOAC developed a SPIFAN proficiency testing program that relies on many of the same reference matrices 
that were used in single lab and multi-lab validations of SPIFM methods themselves. This figure shows the multi-step voluntary consensus process through which SPIFM methods are developed and validated. AOEC's role is to manage the process openly and transparently and serve as an unbiased link between public and private stakeholders. The process begins with inputs from experts and stakeholders on nutrients of interest and the publication of standard method performance requirements. Methods are submitted through open calls and data from single and multi-lab validations are reviewed by experts who then decide if the methods achieve first and final action status. Those that achieve final action status are harmonized with ISO and some with the International Dairy Federation, which lends even greater scientific credibility to the methods. The ultimate goal is to install the methods as Codex Type II dispute resolution for trade purposes, making them globally recognizable as best in class for nutrients and infant formula. This is a list of 15 SPIFAN final action methods that have been adopted as Codex II since 2010. Most were nutrients like vitamins and minerals since they were considered the highest priority. I would like to note that method authors were affiliated with more than 18 different organizations and several industry sectors, illustrating AOAC's ability to harness the power of many experts to navigate complex analytical challenges and achieve common goals. The success of SPIFN continues today with completion of several nutrient methods poised for codex adoption and an evergreen process that realizing new novel ingredients in the pipeline. New work for novel ingredients like human milk of oligosaccharides and lactoferrin was launched earlier this year with plans to launch work for additional novel ingredients in 2021. Lastly, work streams, and work streams for contaminants are in progress and expected to deliver official methods within the next two years. This concludes the fifth and update. Before moving on to the final topic, I would like to underline the importance of SPIFN in advancing and harmonizing standard methods for the infant formula industry and how much we appreciate AOAC in making it all happen. The final portion of my talk, I would like to highlight several food safety work streams in which Abbott is active outside of SPIFM. I'll provide examples of work with AOAC International and the AOAC India section. Chlorate and perchlorate, which originated through SPIFN, has two work streams. The first is method variability study in partnership with AOAC and the U.S. National Institute for Standards and, Meth and Technology. One study was completed earlier this year, but only involved 13 labs. A second study is planned for the first quarter of 21 and has 30 labs. Information from this work stream may help inform a second work stream, which is an AOAC working group that just launched in November. The goal is to develop an SNPR, an official method of analysis for chloride per chloride, an infant formula and infant food. AOEC launched a new initiative this year to develop a voluntary consensus standard for glyphosate and its metabolites in several food matrices, dry commodities, and genetically engineered crops. Several dry commodities are of interest to the nutritional products industry, and so Abbott developed, deployed our scientists to contribute technical expertise to these working groups. Moving to the lower left-hand box, Abbott has sponsored and participated in AOAC's Food Authenticity Program for the past two years. This mission is to develop voluntary consensus standards and targeted and non-targeted test methods to improve surveillance, op surveillance options for economically motivated adulteration. The program has already realized success with approval of six SNPRs for milk, honey, and olive oil using targeted and non-targeted techniques. The scope of the program recently expanded to new food matrices and molecular techniques. And finally, Abbott was one of the first organizations to, to commit AOAC's formation of a gluten and food allergens methods program. This multi-year program seeks to coordinate all future consensus-driven needs, development, validation, and implementation of methods for analysis of a wide range of food-associated allergens and gluten. This is an area of food safety that has received increasing attention recently, 
including the nutritional products industry. We're very excited for this program and hopeful that other organizations will also commit resources. Finally, I would like to end my talk by sharing some of the food safety work Abbott has done in partnership with the AOAC India section. Abbott in India has initiated collaboration with AOAC India chapter right from its inception in 2012. From then, Abbott has partnered with AOEC India's initiatives, whether it's a method harmonization to strengthen local analytical landscape or capacity building. Both of these are key initiatives which support FSSAI's mission as well. Regarding test method harmonization, India, AOEC India selected two Abbott nutritional methods for local validation and adoption from 2017 onwards. Abbott is technical partner in delivering India studies and also supporting on AOAC international platforms like SPIFN, supported by original authors of the methods, both authors being from Abbott. Vitamin B12 study is published in JAOAC and Minerals Method is almost ready to be published. This year, we are funding and providing technical support on melamine and cyanuric acid method development. AOEC India targets to have this as regulatory approved methods. This method study will have steps, single laboratory validation, followed by multi-laboratory validation. Post that, there will be an AOEC publication and representing to FSSAI's method review group before this method gets due recognition of being an official method. On capacity building, Abbott team has supported in the past conducting good laboratory workshop classroom trainings, and technical webinars. We also support technical sessions through conference. We are always there to support such missions globally, and India is one of the top priorities we have. Thank you for your time. I really look forward to further partnership and being together sometime soon. Hoping you and your family stay healthy and safe during these challenging times. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us and thank you for sharing this piece of information. And let's moving on forward with this uh, session. Uh, next, we have over here is Dr. Kaushik Banerjee, co-chair, AOAC Committee of Section. Dr. Kaushik Banerjee is a principal scientist from the ICAR National Research Center for Graves, Pune, India. He is the 2017 Harvey W. Willey Awardee, which is the top most scientific award of the AOAC. International for his contributions to analytical sciences in relation to food safety. He is a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Agriculture Sciences, that is FNAAS, and the Royal Society of Chemistry, FRIC UK. He is also the current chairman of the India section of AOAC International. Dr. Banerjee has widely published in peer-reviewed journals. Being a member of the Food Safety Standards Authority of India's scientific panels and working groups on pesticide residues and methods of sampling and analysis, he regularly contributes to the development and implementation of food safety standards in India. His area of research focuses on the development of efficient analysis methods for the sensitive and confirmatory estimation of contaminate residues in agriculture and food mattresses and risk assessment studies for fixation of crop specific maximum residue limits. So here we have Dr. Kaushik Banerjee and I would like to invite sir to speak on sections role in strengthening AOAC international activities. Can we please have the AB? Greetings to you all. On behalf of the India section of AOAC International, it is my proud privilege to welcome you in today's virtual conference. We are highly honored to have global experts on food authenticity and food safety in today's program. Many thanks for joining us. In this presentation, I would like to share the role a section plays in implementing the strategic plans of AOAC International, how the sections are integrated into the work of AOAC International, and also the focus of sustaining and expanding international relationships through sections to identify new collaborative opportunities 
with existing partnerships. Here I share a brief outline of AOS International's uh, strategic plan. If you look at the vision statement, it signifies about global confidence in consensus-based analytical solutions for food safety, food integrity, and public health. The mission statement talks about uh, the important aspect that AOS International ensures the safety and integrity of foods and other products that impact public health by convening government, industry, and academia to develop and validate standards, methods, and technologies. These are the goals of AOS International Analytical Excellence to provide analytical solutions to current and emerging issues through standard development and trusted measurements. Engagement, to attract and retain members and stakeholders through education, mentoring, networking, and collaboration to grow and strengthen the association. Partnerships, to build and cultivate relationships to identify strategic opportunities for collaboration. Core program, develop new and improve existing processes, products, and services. Sustainability, to identify, strengthen, and grow revenue streams while continuously optimizing resources to ensure the association's long-term success. And finally, governance, to advance an effective leadership culture that promotes accountability among members and staff. And that is the reason why David Schmidt, the executive director of AOS International, has rightly pointed out that not only do sections provide valuable opportunities for information sharing, professional development, and networking at the local level, but they also provide access to AOS International and current initiatives, information, and educational opportunities. AOS is committed to support and promote its sections to develop an active and dedicated membership base. So if you look at the spread of sections, uh, the sections are everywhere across the globe. We have sections in Asia, Europe, Central South America, North America, and Sub-Saharan Africa. In Asian continent itself, there are sections in China, India, Japan, Taiwan, Thailand, and the newly born Southeast Asian section. In Europe, there are two sections, uh, one major section, excluding Belgium, Luxembourg, and Netherlands. And for these two countries, there is a separate lowland section. The Central and South American section is currently under revitalization program. Uh, this includes the regions of Central America, Mexico, South America, and the Caribbean islands. The North America itself includes eight sections. And there is another very young section uh, named Sub-Saharan Africa, which uh, includes almost uh, 50 plus countries of African continent. The India section of AOS International was established in 2011 to understand and address the needs and challenges of the Indian analytical community. And uh, it was uh, a very perfect uh, beginning of this section because uh, it coincided with the functional beginning of Food Safety Standards Authority of India, which is the regulated agency in our country. So from the very beginning, uh, the India section of AOS International provided uh, its major emphasis to develop a corporative relationship and professional networking with the government regulatory bodies, testing laboratories, educational institutes, farms, and industries, and encourage their participation in identifying and developing need-based analytical method and contribute to the skill enhancement and analytical capacity building of the country. Support to the regulatory agencies is a major activity of the India section. And in fact, every section is expected to do that. Uh, the India section took every effort to support uh, FSSAI for domestic food control and the export inspection agency to ensure that the material or consignment of food is tested 
using the appropriate method. So here, the India section is supporting uh, by identifying fit for purpose AOC official methods for particular analysis. Initiate and conduct need-based validation programs wherever appropriate methods are, are not available so that through the single lab validation and multi-lab validation programs involving various stakeholders, appropriate methods can be evolved and that can be recommended and implemented through the regulatory process. Considering the importance and significance of uh, partnership uh, in 2018 annual conference of India section, um, AOS International signed an agreement with FSSAI. So here you can see the photograph where MOU was exchanged between uh, the president of AOS International and the CEO of FSSAI. So this MOU basically allows uh, AOSC methods for all regulatory purposes in India. And uh, through this MOU, AOSC International has provided gratis access to official method of analysis for utilization and implementation in India for regulatory control of food. Method contribution to FSSA through SLV and MLV is a regular activity. Uh, the section supports FSSA scientific panel and methods review group by organizing method development and verification studies for inclusion in FSSA manual. FSSA uh, has several manuals on quality and uh, safety analysis. And in certain cases, there are uh, gaps where appropriate advanced analytical methods are still not recommended. So under such situation, the India section is picking up particular studies in collaboration with stakeholders. Uh, they are under organizing uh, the single lab validation and interlaboratory validation programs. For example, here you can see uh, the first single lab validation study, which was organized uh, on vitamin B12 analysis in Indian infant and pediatric formulas and allergen functions. This method uh, involved uh, several stakeholders. Uh, the method uh, was successfully completed. It was published in Journal of AOS International. It was uh, presented in uh, FSSAI uh, in front of the methods review group. And finally, it has been accepted and included in the FSSA manual. Similarly, uh, considering the importance of the food fortification uh, regulation and program that is going on in our country, uh, the India section uh, helped in conducting a study on folic acid uh, in uh, fortified rice and wheat flour, uh, which is a regulatory requirement. And uh, this method uh, has also been published in Journal of uh, AOS International. This includes singular validation as well as interlaboratory validation study. And this has been included in FSSA manual. Promoting research and development in analytical science is a major focus of all section of AOS International. So here, basically, the section uh, assists the local regulatory agencies and analytical community uh, regarding method development, validation, and uh, promotes uh, the scientists involved to present their work in various conferences, workshops, seminars uh, that are organized by the sections. For example, uh, AOS India section is uh, regularly promoting uh, the young uh, professionals uh, who are working in various universities, uh, research organizations under ICAR, CSIR, etc., and uh, mentoring uh, the uh, presenters uh, to publish their analytical methods in Journal of AOS International. So uh, I can cite two examples where India section contributed special guest editorials to Journal of AOS International based on the presentations made in uh, various annual conferences. For example, here you can see the screenshots um, based on the India sections program uh, in 2015. Uh, we published 10 publications and uh, in uh, early uh, 2020 or at the end of 2019, uh, this uh, proceedings of the fourth and fifth annual conference was also published. And in each case, there are uh, 10 publications, which mainly uh, presents the data related to food safety, food authenticity, uh, various uh, chemical analysis and microbiological analysis, and even certain important review articles related to 
the uh, regularly monitored as well as emerging food contaminants. A section is expected to organize multi-city workshops and training courses on various aspects, which includes the regulatory aspects, uh, includes the sample preparation workflows, uh, the instrumentation techniques, and these are basically organized uh, for national capacity building. So here are uh, certain photographs uh, I'm sharing, where in collaboration with uh, regulatory organizations, as well as technology providers, uh, the section organized various programs across the country. And uh, because of the COVID-19 situation, uh, which is prevailing across the globe, uh, India section is doing these activities in virtual mode. Nurturing and empowering today's youth, uh, creating tomorrow's leadership. Uh, this is the current focus of all sections. And India section showed the path to all sections. I'm very proud uh, uh, to say this. Uh, we are involving youngsters uh, like uh, PhD and master students and young researchers to manage the section's routine activities. And uh, they are supporting us in organizing conferences, workshops, and various uh, other programs. So uh, to ensure and to encourage the participation of youngsters, we also instituted uh, two awards. One is Young Scientist Award, and another is Women in Analytical Science Award. Uh, the poster awards are also co-sponsored by Royal Society of Chemistry, which is another uh, great advantage in participating in India sections programs. So finally, my thoughts and visions uh, for the AOSC sections uh, as a part of the AOSC committee of uh, sections uh, and its co-chair, uh, I visualize that every section should create an all-inclusive platform so that all the stakeholders of the analytical community can come together. They can discuss analytical sciences, improve quality of testing, and build confidence in analytical results in the region. Align and integrate the work with the objective of AOS International. It's very important. AOS International has an all-inclusive philosophy, and uh, the section should improve that and uh, maybe uh, support the AOS International uh, to improve its presence in the local region. The section would emerge as the technical partner for national and regulatory agencies of the country or of the region. And that's very important because through that process only the section can uh, justify its presence in the particular region because we are here to support the community by providing fit for purpose analytical methods. And finally, harmonize the activities across sections. Every section is organizing a lot of activities and there is no point in repeating that. So it would be a great endeavor if the sections collaborate, they partner with each other in organizing various programs, in organizing or initiating various validation programs, because food safety is a global issue. And in most cases, whether it's a food contaminant, food nutrition, allergen, whatever, or microbiological food safety issues, these are global issues. So sections can collaborate and support each other to achieve the goal. So finally, a section would be expected to play a lead role in implementing the global strategic endeavors of AOS International in the region. I wish every success to this uh, conference. Uh, please enjoy the talks and participate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kaushik Banerjee, for joining us and sharing this piece of information. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, joining us over here from globally around the world, this is AOAC International. India's Action presents virtual conference meet on food authenticity and food safety conference. So, though this is a virtual uh, conference meet, still, uh, this is now time for a small tea break that we are taking for 10 minutes. It's 11.25, and we'll be back by 11.35 a.m. sharp. So, we'll join you after the tea break of 10 minutes. Thank you.
Hello everyone and welcome back to AOAC International India section. Presents virtual conference meet on food authenticity and food safety conference, even supported by FSSAI and our technical partner Abert. And let's moving forward. Uh, in this uh, virtual meet conference, I'm your host Kiran. And next, I would like to invite over here Dr. Chris Elliott, Queen's University, in Belfast, UK. Chris is currently professor of food safety and founder of the Institute for Global Food Security at Queen's University, Belfast. He served as Pro Vice Chancellor, responsible for the medical and life sciences faculty between 2015 and 2018. He has published more than 460 peer review articles, many of them relating to the detection and control of agriculture, food, and environmental related contaminants. These have gained over 10,000 citations. Protecting the integrity of the food supply chain from fraud is also a key research topic. And Chris led the independent review of Britain's food system following the 2013 Horse Meat Scandal. He currently coordinates a flagship Horizon 2020 project involving 16 European and 17 Chinese partners on food safety and also coordinates a European Institute of Innovation and Technology flagship research project. Over the years, Chris has developed a high level of network of collaborators across Europe, the United States, the Middle East, India, and Asia. He is a visiting professor at the China Agriculture University in Beijing and the Chinese Academy of Sciences and Thammasat University in Thailand. He is a recipient of a Winston Churchill Fellowship and is an elected fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and Royal Society of Biology. Chris has received numerous prizes and awards for his work. In 2017, he was awarded the Royal Society of Chemistry Theophilus Redwood Prize and was also awarded an OBE by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. He was elected a member of the Royal Irish Academy in 2020. So with this uh, brief introduction, uh, Dr. Chris Elliott, I would like to welcome him over here to speak on fighting global food crime with analytical chemistry. So can we please have the AB? Hello there. My name is Coke Elliott. I'm Professor of Food Safety at Queen's University Belfast in the United Kingdom. I'm also the founder of the Institute for Global Food Security. It's my great pleasure to present at this AOAC meeting. I really wish I could have been there in person. and I very much hope next year that I will be. So I wanted to talk a little bit about <clears throat> some of the work that we have undertaken my research group in terms of using analytical chemistry to fight crime, criminal activity in the world's food supply system. This slide shows what the world food supply system is like, highly complex. And when you get complex systems like this, things can go wrong accidentally or on purpose. And when I talk about on purpose, I'm going to give you some information about when people set out to cheat the food supply system, deliberately adulterate food for, for a financial gain. I, I refer to this as food crime, <clears throat> criminal activity in the food supply system. And you know, there's many, many victims of food crime. And first of all, thinking about the major trading routes of agriculture and food commodities that happen across the world. And this, this map shows that very nicely. But we have another map which shows pretty much the same trading routes, except this, you know, the trading routes of organized criminal activity, it narcotics, people smuggling, firearms, counterfeiting. The trading routes are very similar. And those people involved in this type of criminal activity are also highly involved in food crime activity as well. Now, what does fraud in food look like? And the first type of, of, of example is we call it substitution fraud. And that's where goods of a high value are replaced with lower value goods. <coughs> 
An example is the horse meat scandal that happened right across Europe in 2014. And that was where beef was being replaced by very low value, low quality horse meat. Another example that happens in many parts of the world is fraud with olive oil. And you get substitution of much lower quality types of, of vegetable oils into olive oil, again, for people just to make money. Next type of fraud is, we call it addition fraud. <clears throat> and that's where something is added to food to give it a perceived higher value. We've done a lot of work with herbs and spices in terms of adding things to it, because a lot of the, the particularly the spices in the world are traded based on the color and you can get uh, industrial dyes being added to spices <clears throat> to make them seem of higher value. The same is true with milk, and we had massive scandals in terms of the addition of, of fraudulent <coughs> sources of nitrogen to milk to cheat the system. We also have frauds associated with what we call false claims. The labels that are on food and things that guide us, that, that help us make our decisions about our food purchases. And that might be the country of origin has stated that it's welfare friendly, organic, fair trade. If these claims are made and they're not true, again, it's a form of fraud. I've investigated fraud in the global food supply system for a long time, more than 30 years. <clears throat> and my experience is whenever you set out to try to detect the fraud <coughs> and, and, and you find a way to do it, the criminals will find another way to cheat. And the reason for that is because so much money is made. More, more money than, than is made in the world's narcotics trade, for instance. The, the amount of money made in the world food supply system by fraud is estimated to be in the region of 40 to 50 billion US dollars. That's a lot of money. In terms of those people who are cheated, first of all, it is us, <clears throat> it is the citizens. We face economic losses and we also feel like we've been cheated by the food industry. The food industry itself is a victim. <clears throat> Those companies that get involved in, the, in, in criminal activity in food supply systems, they feel like they've let their customers down. <clears throat> it's a cause of massive reputational damage and companies can, can face massive, massive financial losses. But I am a professor of food safety and I'm, I'm most interested in the things that impact human health. So I talked about the fraud in milk and we go back 10 years to the melamine scandal in India. And that was actually cheating an analytical test. Because milk is valued based on the amount of protein that's present and the amount of protein is men measured using the Keldal nitrogen method. The fraud was adding different sources of nitrogen to the milk to make it seem like there, there was more protein present. And that source of nitrogen was melamine, a byproduct of the plastic industry, a little bundle of, of nitrogen. The big issue was that when it was ingested, that melamine started to polymerize and started to cause massive damage to the kidneys, particularly of young children. And it's estimated that more than 300,000 infants were hospitalized in China and there were a number of fatalities associated with it. The cheating that I referred to in terms of the spices and the addition of colors, quite often those are industrial dyes, things like Sudan Red, and those are very toxic agents and will, will, will exert their toxicity over a prolonged period of exposure, chronic exposure. Fraud can even impact on our religious beliefs. <clears throat> For instance, fraud in terms of kosher food, of halal food, <clears throat> foods that, that, that are very much associated with a particular religion or belief. And there can be cheating there by people setting out to make more money. <clears throat> There's even fraud associated with bonded labor. And this was a story, a big story that appeared in the UK a couple of years ago where the shrimp industry in Thailand was shown to have 
bonded labour, another form of cheating. One of my very good PhD students a number of years ago looked at the impacts of milk fraud on food safety and particular emphasis on developing countries and a lot of this work we studied India itself. And we found more than 50 different ways that fraud was being perpetrated in milk. Not only were there safety implications, but also there were implications about the nutritional value of the milk itself because it was being diluted down and, and uh, particularly young children were, were suffering from nutritional deficiencies because of the cheating. We can even have environmental impacts of fraud, particularly around fishing, where you get fishing happening in areas where fishing stocks are depleted. So you can see there are many, many different aspects to fraud. Now, the first case study I want to talk to you about is a tip off that I received about five years ago. And it happened locally in the UK, but became an international scandal. And it was around herbs and spices. I was told there was massive cheating, particularly in the herb oregano. Oh, oregano is familiar to many of us. <clears throat> you buy the little 20 gram or 30 gram jars in the stores and in the supermarkets. It can also be added to many, many different types of foods, particularly Italian foods. And the fraud itself <clears throat> isn't around the oregano leaves, which you can see very clearly what they look like, their shape, their morphology. But like many type, different types of herbs, they get dried and they get crushed and, and then they get uh, added into many, many different food products. And it's these crushed products. So here we have four different types of oregano that, that we studied. But actually, they're not oregano. This one is crushed myrtle leaves. This one crushed olive leaves. This one crushed sister's leaves. And in fact, we only have one genuine oregano. And the cheating is the blending of these different types of leaves together, the very high value oregano being diluted with the low value or no value adulterants. When I first started to look at this five years ago, the gold standard was to use microscopy. So you look down a microscope and see if you can see different fragments of different leaves analytically unbelievably challenging. You needed very, very, very skilled people to do it. And you were lucky if they could detect maybe 25 or 30% levels of adulteration. So myself and my research group, we started to think about what new ways could we use analytical chemistry to try to detect this fraud. And the idea was to produce fingerprints food fingerprints that could help identify species, breed, geographic origin, many, many different assets and facets of food. This idea of fingerprinting is the fingerprint matches that food or it doesn't. We can go to a traffic light where we test it and we get a green light, everything is okay. We test it, we get a red light, something is not right about that particular food. We've done a huge amount of work on the use of molecular spectroscopy to produce these types of fingerprints. In the case of oregano, we used FTIR and we undertook multiple scans of oregano and the adulterants collected from many, many different parts of the world. And the scans might look very, very similar, but then when we apply statistical analysis, chemometrics to this, we can produce very nice statistical models that will separate out the genuine oregano, which is in the orange, from all of the different adulterants that we have tried to, to uh, identify. And then we can produce mixtures and blends of those, and again, start to develop models where we can not only say that there's an adulterant present, but give an indication of how much the adulterant was. Based on our method validation, we were getting uh, uh, measurement predictions in the region of about 95%, very, very high success rates for a very rapid, low cost screening test. But we wanted to get a even more 
powerful form of analysis because 95% is good. But if you want to take somebody to court, prosecute them, cancel contracts, you need a higher level of certainty. So we, sweat, we <clears throat> turned our attention to the science of metabolomics and using high resolution mass spectrometry started to screen the metabolome of oregano, looking for markers, clusters of biomarkers, which would give an indication that it was genuine oregano or clusters of biomarkers that would give an indication that it was the adulterants themselves. We used time of flight mass spectrometry and started to produce these ion maps, very complicated ion maps of the genuine material and the adulterated material. <clears throat> and again, they'll look unbelievably similar, but by applying very good statistical measurements, by applying the chemometrics, again, we could pull out the features that gave the distinct classification, whether it was genuine or adulterated organo. So here we have the results of many, many analyses undertaken by time of flight mass spectrometry on oregano. On the left of the slide, you can see there are a cluster of, 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 of samples within the green circle. <clears throat> and within that circle, you can see actually two distinct clusters. And well, actually that's oregano that originates from Europe and Asia. <clears throat> and the bottom cluster is oregano that originates from Central and Southern America. So not only can we tell it's oregano, we can actually tell the, the continent that it came from. And all of those samples that sit outside that circle were adulterated with one of many, many different types of, of oregano that, that uh, we have uh, uh, found <coughs> to be used. Well, we published our work in food chemistry in terms of this uh, comprehensive strategy to detect the adulteration of herbs. <clears throat> it, it's something that we were very proud of, but we decided to go a little bit further and we undertook a survey of oregano that was on sale in the UK and Ireland, either through stores and shops or from the internet. What we were very surprised to find that 25% of all of the oregano on sale in the UK and Ireland was adulterated in some way. <clears throat> This was really quite a surprise to us. But then <clears throat> this story that we published went viral right across the world. And we started to get samples of oregano coming from many, many different countries. <clears throat> this is the example of Australia, who sent us 12 different commercial brands of oregano. And in Australia, it was seven out of 12 of the samples were oregano adulterated. And some of them had less than 10% of oregano in it. So the fraud that was happening in Australia was massive. And as a result of this work, two of the companies that were selling the oregano were prosecuted by the Australian authorities. Well, I can show you many examples around the world. This one happens to be Norway, where the same thing happened. <clears throat> we got samples, we tested them using our spectroscopy and high resolution mass spectrometry and find evidence of adulteration. So we've had samples from many countries around the world and <clears throat> on average about 25% of all of the samples of oregano that we have tested have shown themselves to be adulterated. And I would be very keen to get some samples to come from India to test in our, in our, in our uh, uh, testing methodologies. So please feel free to send me any samples and we will analyze them. Now, when we went to look at the fraud, <clears throat> uh, a lot of oregano in, in uh, Europe <clears throat> originates from Turkey. And we started to look at the production data for oregano in Turkey. The year that the fraud was highlighted to me was very interesting because Turkey produced less than 12,000 metric tons of oregano and exported more than 14,000 tons of oregano. So very, very clearly massive fraud happening. And now we, we can see that the mass balance, the amount of oregano produced and, and uh, sold very, very much correlates with each other. And it's very interesting that in Turkey, what the producers of oregano are told that 
Chris Elliott at Queen's University is testing your production some time to stop cheating. That's the power of analytical chemistry. Now, I wanted to give you a second case study in terms of the use of fingerprinting. And this time, <clears throat> again, we're going to use advanced mass spectrometry, time of flight mass spectrometry, but this time we have attached it to what's called the Reams laser source. <clears throat> so this is a surgeon's scalpel attached to a laser. And what we do is <clears throat> we cut into the sample with a scalpel, we switch the laser on and it burns the sample and the smoke from the burn gets injected into the mass spec and within a few seconds, we get a profile, uh, particularly of the phospholipids that are present in the sample. Now, in terms of, of looking at the species that a foodstuff is, <clears throat> very commonly, some form of gel work will be done, either protein gels or nucleic acid gels. <clears throat> These are really quite expensive and they take quite a long time to complete. So what we set out to do was to see if we could use this RIMS technology to differentiate between five different whitefish. <clears throat> Those species are called cod, coli, haddock, pollock, and whiting. Genetically very similar, so a very challenging uh, uh, experiment for us to do. We collected together nearly 500 samples of the fish and we uh, started to analyze the fatty acids and the glycophospholipids using the RIMS technology. And what we found is when we looked at these different species, actually the phospholipid profiles were very, very different and it was quite easy to tell this apart. So taking this data, doing the statistical analysis, the chemometrics again, we can see that we can very, very clearly identify the different species of fish through the different clusters. <clears throat> very, very accurate way to measure the species of fish. And the analysis only takes about five or 10 seconds, unbelievably quick. So the great innovation of this technique that we call the eye knife is that we take a sample, we can scan it, and within two or three seconds, we will get a result. And the validation of our model <laughs> comes to about 99% accurate. So a very, very innovative way of, of, of doing analysis for species using mass spectrometry. Now, we collect a huge amount of data, masses amount of data when we were doing this metabolic fingerprinting by reams. And one of my very good PhD students at the time took the data and he went and analyzed it. And actually, not only could he tell the species of the fish, he could tell how the fish was being captured, whether it was by trawler or by line and pole, just again by doing the chemometric modeling. So masses amount of data there. And really what we're doing is we're detecting two different types of fraud in fishing, uh, species substitution, and also the catch method with one single analytical test. Then we decided to look at another challenge, we call it the three sin challenge. And this was, could we identify the species, the geographical origin and the production method of shrimp in a single untargeted me metabolomics approach? This project was done by a good friend of mine, uh, Naladri. I hope Naladri, you're listening to this. Naladri got a very prestigious fellowship to come to, to my laboratory at Queen's University to do this work. And together we collected five different types of shrimp. King prawns, tiger prawns, Argentinian red shrimp, Indian white shrimps, and Indian pink shrimps. And the idea was, could we tell the species, the geographic origins in a single test? <clears throat> And again, very, very quickly, the ability to measure these uh, different types of king prawn using metabolomics what was identified very quickly in time of flight mass spectrometry. And again, the same principle was applied is that within two or three seconds of, of measuring the, the presence of the phospholipids in these uh, different types of prawns, we, we could get a result very quickly. We've now 
started to take an, a, a large study in the UK and Ireland to determine if there's any shrimp fraud happening here at the moment. So in terms of what are the next types of sins that we will investigate in terms of food fraud, a scandal that broke in Europe last year was about fraud in tuna. <clears throat> and what we have is the before and after, and what we have is very, very low quality, poor grade tuna that should be used for pet food was, was being uh, chemically modified to make it look like very fresh tuna. And that fraud is happening through the injection of some chemicals and also carbon monoxide into the tuna to bring back that coloration. So this is something that we want to investigate further using our fingerprinting technique. How will we do this? Well, we will again use this type of ambient mass spectrometry where sample preparation is absolutely minimal. And we're very lucky to be what we call a center of innovation with Waters Corporation. And we have many different types of ambient mass spectrometry to do this. But in our research group at the moment, we're investigating many di different types of fraud. We continue our fight against the fraud in herbs and spices in seafood, but also we're doing a massive amount of work on rice. <clears throat> and we have collected some incredible data using different technology platforms where we can tell the type of rice, the country that it comes from. We're also doing a lot of work with, with meat fraud as well. And always the next question is, what will be the next type of fraud that we investigate? And we're very, very keen to work with collaborators across the world. If you think you've identified a problem, if you think you want to work with my research group to develop new cutting edge, innovative analytical tests to detect the fraud, please let me know. We love to work with people across the world. We love to work with people in India. So you have an open in invitation. Please contact me and I would be delighted to develop some sort of collaboration. So this is the end of my, my uh, lecture. I hope, you, I hope it's given you a bit of a flavor about how analytical chemistry, really good analytical chemistry, can fight the bad guys in the world's food system. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chris, for joining us over here and sharing this piece of information. And let's moving forward now. Uh, I would like to invite over here Dr. Lalita Gora. And Dr. Lalita Gora retired as Chief Scientist of CSIR, Central Food Technology. Research Institute Mysore in June 2014. She received her PhD in biochemistry from Baylor University, Texas, USA, and has had postdoctoral training at the Department of Biochemistry from University of Cambridge, Cambridge, UK. Her research and teaching career spans over 35 years in the areas of structural biology of plant proteins, food science, detailed focused analytical food safety with deep knowledge and understanding of food safety regulations. She is the corresponding author of 85 peer reviewed academic publications of international repute, five chapter in books, one book, technical manuals and articles for the popularization of science. Over the course of her research career has mentored 12 students for their PhD in biochemistry and 35 master students for their dissertation. She is passionate about teaching and knowledge dissemination in the areas of basic biochemistry, analytical chemistry, food quality and safety outreach and capacity building programs. She is currently a member of the scientific committee Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee, under Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Chairperson of the Scientific Panel on GM Foods, FSSAI, and Board of Governors, National Institute of Technology, Surat Kal, Karnataka. She is the recipient of several awards throughout her academic and scientific career which include the Sri Devi Memorial Gold Medal in MSc Biochemistry, University of Madras, Best Teaching Assistant Award, Baylor University, Texas, USA, and the prestigious Sir C. V. Raman Young Scientist Award for Life Sciences, 1997 from Government of Karnataka. She received the CSIR, C. 
CFTRI Foundation Day Award for the best research paper published six times. She is also the recipient of the SSAI Eat Right Award 2019 in the professional category. And now I would like to invite her on screen to speak on the session of a food authenticity testing. India perspective, honey, can we please have the AV? I would like to thank OAC India for giving me this opportunity to present, to make a presentation on honey authenticity, the Indian perspective. Honey is a widely consumed natural product, which is obtained from the nectar of flowers and the aerodigestive tract of the honey bee. Not only is honey desirable for its taste and nutritional value, but also for its health benefits. Honeybees are the only insects that produce something that humans eat. It is also the only food that never goes bad. And honey is aptly called the soul of a field of flowers. As can be seen, what is needed to produce one kilogram of honey is about one million flowers and 50,000 bee flies. Also, if you look at it, you see that to get one gram of honey, you need two grams of nectar. This nectar is concentrated in the honeycomb by the worker bees by flapping their wings to evaporate the honey. And each beehive can produce about 20 kilograms of honey per year. Uh, India also is an exporter of honey and it exports about 100 million US dollars of uh, honey with USA being the major importer of Indian honey. If we look at the definition of honey in the food safety and standards uh, rules and regulations and the FSSAI Act, the definition does not differ from that of Codex Alimentarius. Very clearly, it is defined that it is the natural sweet substance produced by honeybees from the nectar of blossoms or from the secretion of plants. But what you see over here is that the honeybee, the genus of the honeybee is not defined. It just says honeybee. Well, the common name for Apis mellifera is honeybee. And so therefore it is assumed that all the honey in the standards is from the honey uh, bee. Honey is classified in several different ways. And the major forms of classifying honey is its origin being the most important, followed by color or its consistency or the production method. So this classification of honey is very useful to the consumer to choose the type of the honey that is uh, required. In terms of origin, honey is characterized or classified into the floral honey and the honeydew honey. Floral honey is honey which is obtained from nectar, whereas honeydew honey is obtained from the sap of plants. You could also have a mix of the two. It could be floral honeydew many honey or honeydew floral honey. Among the floral honey or the blossom honey, this is further divided into unifloral and multifloral. The uni unifloral honey being much more expensive than the multifloral honey. Unifloral indicates that it is obtained from a single plant species. And countries have defined what unifloral is, as we will see later. FSSAI also has defined it. And you have multifloral where the honey or the nectar is collected from various plant species and generally characterized such as meadow honey where the plant species are all from the meadow or from the forest known as forest honey. 
Coming to the color of honey, honey can be characterized by its color. The color of honey ranges from almost colorless to a very dark brown. This color of honey depends on the constituents that are present in honey, mainly the polyphenols and the flavonoids, which give the honey its uh, color. So you will see that the New Zealand honey is almost white. Manuka honey is in between. And honey, which is obtained from, say, the black seed or the uh, buckwheat, etc., they are much darker. So honey ranges like almost, as I said, from water white to dark brown or uh, black. Honey is also classified by its marketable condition, that is its consistency. Two types of honey are available there. One is the normal honey that we get, which is known as the liquid honey. And this liquid, liquid honey is liquid at room temperature. You have the solid honey where the honey can solidify. And mainly it solidifies because of the uh, high sugar content in it. Very often you will see a liquid layer on top. And that could be the honey is very rich in fructose. The Fourth method of classification of honey is the production method. In the production method, the manufacturing process is the basis of its classification. So you can get comb honey, where in the honey bottle you will see pieces of the comb. Pressed honey is available, and this is the honey that is commonly uh, marketed or commercially available where the uh, honey is uh, pressed and you also have the centrifugal uh, honey or the honey which is extracted from the comb. Chunk honey is honey which is available in bottle where chunks are added to it and then honey poured all over it so you can see the chunks in the uh, honey. So based on the various types of honey that are available, the price of honey depends on mainly the origin, the botanical origin or the geographical or an origin. If we look at FSSAI labeling regulations for honey, we find that honey is defined and can be labeled either as monofloral honey or as multifloral honey. This is not binding and it depends on the pollen content. If the pollen content of a single species of a plant is above 45%, it can be labeled as monofloral honey. If it is below 45% of and contains a large number of plant species, then it is multifloral honey. Also defined in the regulations is Carvia callosa honey as well as the uh, honey dew uh, honey. If we look at the nutritional uh, composition of honey, honey, like many other compounds, is uh, has very high nutritional uh, value. It consists mainly of uh, sugars and water. And also it has minor constituents, which are the minerals, the fatty acids, the uh, vitamins, uh, polyphenols, flavonoids, etc., which make honey uh, an important liquid and very important for medicinal uh, uses and uh, the uh, other therapeutic uh, uses. Honey is also rich in compounds such as the amino acids and enzymes. Several enzymes are known to be uh, present in honey. So the biochemical characterization of honey indicates not only does it contain the monosaccharides, disaccharides, it also contains flavonoids, phenolic acids, lipids, esters, aldehydes and ketones, which are the volatiles, and give honey its uh, aroma. 
So the therapeutic uh, potential of honey is well validated and documented. It is known to have, be, have high antimicrobial activity, antioxidant activity. It is a natural immune booster and also a remedy for a number of ailments. An important factor about honey is that it is also known to be an anti-diabetic agent. Syringic acid, which is a constituent of honey, is known to be an inhibitor of aldose reductase, which is responsible for cataract formation. And so therefore the anti-diabetic potential has been proven by several studies. Because of all these properties of honey, honey has become a commodity which is prone to several fraudulent practices. So honey is prone to different types of fraud. One of the major types of fraud for honey is the addition of different sugar syrups, ranging from adding cane sugar to corn syrup, beet sugar, rice syrups, uh, wheat, etc. A second type of fraud is harvesting an immature honey. That means honey which is or the nectar which has not been concentrated and then doing a vacuum concentration of the uh, honey. Masking and mislabeling of the geographical or botanical origin is rampant and further artificial feeding of bees during a nectar flow when nectar is not available also is practiced rampantly. U.S. Pharmacopoeia indicates, the food fraud database indicates that honey ranks as the third favorite food target for adulteration only behind milk and olive oil. So how do we um, detect these frauds and how do you say that honey is authentic? There are two important aspects of honey authenticity. These are the production and the origin. In the production, other than the processing and the water content, the main fraudulent practice is the addition of uh, sugars. And the addition of sugars is based on, mainly based on adding either cane, cane sugar or the syrups, as we will see. So the sugar adulteration is from two different types of plants that is the C4 plants and the C3 plants, these are characterized based on their photosynthesis. So if honey is adulterated either with the corn syrup or with sucrose, techniques such as the elemental analysis coupled with IRMS can be used to detect these adulterations. The AOAC method 998.12 is well validated and it is a robust method for detecting the fraudulent addition of C4 sugars to uh, honey. A combination of the elemental analysis, IRMS, and liquid chromatography, IRMS, has been used to detect the fraudulent addition of sugars either from beet or rice or chicory or, or wheat. If we the detection of adulteration with the uh, sugars or uh, with sucrose or with the corn syrup, as I said, is through elemental analysis. So in this method, the protein of the honey is extracted and honey as such is used and it is subjected to elemental analysis where it is combusted into carbon dioxide and the ratio of the C13 and C12 is determined. By determining the ratios, the difference in the uh, delta C13 value of protein and honey are noted. And it is apparent that if it is not adulterated, they are almost equivalent. And 
the amount of adulteration, that is the quantity of the C4 adulteration can be uh, calculated by using the formula which is shown over here. See, to um, identify or to detect the adulteration with the other sugars, LCIRMS is used. In this procedure, the liquid chromatography, the sugars of honey are separated by ion exchange chromatography on a calcium column, eluted with water. The sugars, the chromatogram, in the order of elution through an interface are oxidized. They undergo a, either a wet oxidation or a very high temperature com uh, combustion and they are converted into carbon dioxide and other gases which are absorbed. The carbon dioxide passes into the IRMS and the chromatogram is obtained showing the C13 by C12 uh, ratios of each of these sugars, very similar to a LC chromatogram that you see in ordinary LC analysis. The individual carbon dioxide uh, peaks, as I said, are admitted into the IRMS and the delta 13 values of each of these uh, peaks appears in the, in the data and can be used. So what you see over here in the upper left hand corner is a chromatogram of a pure honey sample. And looking at the delta-13 uh, ratios of the uh, fructose glucose and doing delta C13 of fructose minus glucose, you see it is less than one, indicating that it is not adulterated. Also, the delta C13 max between the sugars and between the sugar and protein can be calculated. If it is adulterated with either corn syrup or with sucrose, the theta, delta C13 value of fructose increases. And if you look at the difference between the delta C13 value of fructose and glucose, you will see that the difference is much higher. The difference is discernible and the adulteration with C4 sugars, with sugars from C4 plants is uh, calculated and as using the formula this can be calculated. Now coming to the adulteration with sugars from the C3 plants, once again it from the LCIRMS chromatogram what you get is the ratios of the C12 and C13 ratio which can be used. In addition if syrups are used Sugars which are not present in honey also can be detected as seen over here. Generally in a, a honey LCIRMS chromatogram, what you see is fructose, glucose, the disaccharides and the trisaccharides. If it's adulterated, you generally see the oligosaccharides with a higher degree of polymerization. And using the area under the curve which is computed, you can calculate what we call as the foreign oligosaccharides. If we look at the food safety and standards uh, for honey uh, in India, you see that we have the general parameters or the classical parameters which are generally uh, analyzed. And to analyze the adulteration, we also have these parameters which are sh uh, shaded in pink. So according to the standards, the sugar content from C4 plants, maximum permissible is 7. The delta C13 maximum difference between all the measured C30 values should be uh, plus or minus 2.1. The difference between fructose and glucose should be less than 1, equal to or less than 1. And if we uh, see the difference between protein and honey is again uh, equal to or less than one. In addition to these parameters, earlier we had the parameters to detect the specific marker for rice syrup, which was the 2-acetylphenone glucoside. But this is a production marker. 
it is not an endogenous marker to any of the adulterants and depends on how the rice syrup is processed. And since this marker, the level of this marker is not consistent in all the rice syrups, this parameter has been kept in abeyance. The second parameter which has been kept in abeyance is the trace marker for rice syrup, which was, which is arsenic. Again, it is found that even pure honey has got the high levels of arsenic in it. And so we do not have any baseline data. But one of the parameters that instead of using the specific marker for rice syrup, the foreign oligosaccharide parameter is much more relevant to detect adulteration with sugars. So in honey authenticity, the adulteration with sugars, with exogenous sugars, is easily identifiable by techniques. And these techniques have been very, very well validated. Now coming to the second aspect of honey authenticity, that is the origin, mainly the botanical and uh, geographic uh, uh, origin. Of course, organic is only known by provenance. The botanical and geographic origin can be detected by measuring parameters which can be targeted. These could be the phenolic compounds, could be the pollen count, it could be organic acids, proteins, amino acids, and minerals. I will just describe two or three studies that were done with Indian honey to detect the or to identify the botanical uh, origin. Several methods are available. We can use either the classical methods such as pollen count, which is known as melisopollinology, or we can use modern methods, the advanced methods such as HPLC, uh, GCMSMS, LCMSMS, uh, uh, NMR, amino acid analysis, and molecular biology techniques. In a study that was carried out with honeys obtained from Kashmir Valley, by pollen analysis, simple melanophysiology, the pollen analysis was carried out and all the honey samples which were collected from the honey could be, were unifloral and there were four types of honey. One was honey which was obtained from cherry plant, then the saffron had one, the other had saffron pollen, the third had the apple pollen and the fourth had the wild bush uh, pollen. The pollen analysis of melanophysiology is a good technique to um, for uh, the uh, botanical origin, but it has its limitations in that the technique is time consuming, laborious. It requires specialized knowledge and expertise for the interpretation of the results. You need very good experience uh, having looked at several micrograms of pollen grains so that you can identify and the counting of the pollen grains has to be perfect. Two analysts may get two different values because different opinions may occur regarding the use of the pollen present. And also you need a database or a comprehensive collection of pollen grains of all the floral species that are uh, available. So coming uh, to the uh, botanical origin, a second method using the advanced techniques can target any of the parameters that are present in the nectar, mainly either the volatile compounds or the phenolics or any other minor compounds such as the micro uh, elements. Several phenolics are present in uh, the honey and they can be easily targeted. For example, quercetin or ferulic acid or homogenic acid. So also there are several volatile compounds which are responsible for the aroma and these could be targeted for identifying the floral or the botanical origin of the plant. Uh, in the study on the Kashmir Valley honey, in addition to pollen analysis, they also determined 
the total phenol content, flavonoid, antioxidant uh, activity, uh, both the DPPH and the ascorbic acid. They did a color analysis of it. I also did an analysis of the minerals and electric conduit. Their study showed that three of the parameters could be used as variables for explaining the botanical origin of the honey. One was potassium, which was very high, and it was used for discriminating the honey between the floral uh, classes. The second was the color value. In the color value, it was the B. And third was the electrical conductivity. What their study showed that these uh, honeys clearly segregated in the scatter plot that was uh, done using the linear discriminant uh, analysis. And what you see uh, incidentally across the diagonal of here is the honey from the horticultural crops that is cherry, the apple and saffron. Whereas honey from the wild bush segregated into a separate group by itself. And this was further proved by doing a hierarchical cluster analysis or the uh, dendrogram of it. So clearly this study showed that you could, the pollen analysis and the chemometric analysis with the other constituents could be used for geographic origin. And what was very interesting is that what was identified by pollen analysis was identical to that identified by the chemometric analysis. Coming to the botanical origin of Indian honeys, a second study used different techniques such as FTIR, HPLC for the polyphenols and GCMS for the volatile compounds and then did a principal component analysis and from the uh, several honey samples that were analyzed, they could identify four unifloral honeys, that is honey from lychee, honey from neem, which contained azadiractin and homovanilic acid as the marker, honey from lime uh, and from eucalyptus with triacetin and acetoin as the marker and ginger oil. Most of the other honeys which were analyzed were all multifloral containing multi uh, species. Free amino acids of honey are a target parameter that can be used for uh, identifying the botanical origin of uh, honey because it is very easy to do a free amino acid profile of the honey. In the honey bee honeys, Proline is the dominant amino acid. It is known that in several geographic regions, the honey lack cysteine and methane. And so therefore, this can be used as a parameter to identify the geographical origin of honey. Using amino acids, a very interesting study published uh, recently showed that the uh, botanical origin could be very easily identified by doing the uh, free amino acid analysis and then chemometrics. And here what you see is a partial least square discriminant analysis score plot. What it shows is these honeys uh, based on their floral origin segregated together. But more interesting in this study was that the Amino acid, free amino acid analysis could also segregate the honey based on the entomological origin. When I say entomological origin, it shows that honey from the honeybee, that is from the Apis mellifera, could be identified and distinguished between the honey from stingless bees. Stingless bees are also known to produce honey, and this study shows that it could be very well separated and you could identify the honeybee honey from the stingless bee uh, honey. Now, when we say the stingless bee honey, the question arises is, do countries have regulations or standards for stingless bees? Not many countries have a standard for this honey. Malaysia has a standard because it 
a large amount of uh, stingless bee honey is there. India does not have a standard. It is known that the honey of stingless bee is superior both in terms of its nutritional care, uh, composition, biochemical composition, and therapeutic value. It is higher than that of the honey bee. The production of the stingless bee honey is very limited because the stingless bee is very uh, small. So the amount of honey produced is there. This renders its price and it is sold at a premium price much, much higher than the honey bee uh, honey and uh, for its therapeutic purposes. It is also estimated that in other countries, the price of the stingless bee honey is much higher. So do we need standards for the stingless bee honey? Because its composition, the water uh, or the moisture is much higher, the maltose levels are much uh, higher, and the um, le levels of the enzymes are much higher. So we have to think about whether we need a standard. A last study that I want to describe is that of honey, uh, which was identified in the Mizoram area. So in this study, they had they took a biological approach to uh, identify the floral uh, origin of this. So they carried out a DNA barcoding. The pollen was extracted and DNA was extracted from the pollen. It was subjected to uh, the markers were identified, that is a barcode markers. Commonly, RBCL is used as a core barcode marker. And in addition, they use a second marker, which is the ITS2 uh, marker. These uh, were cloned into TA, uh, TA uh, plasmids, and then they were sequenced and subjected to a blast search. From the blast search, the 29 honey samples contained 22 different plant species, indicating that all the honey samples that were analyzed were multifloral. And uh, most of the plant species which were identified in the multifloral species were those of the horticultural uh, crops, such as the tobacco, uh, cucumber, the amaranthus, etc., and the star fruit, indicating that the honeybees uh, foraged on what was available, that is the horticultural plants, which uh, probably uh, because of deforestation, there were no white plants uh, seen. So in conclusion uh, of this, what I would say is, that there is no single method which can ensure the botanical and geographical origin. We have to use a combination of uh, methods or identify more than one parameter, combine it with chemometrics to determine the botanical and geographical origin. This is a would be difficult because you have to have a valid method for botanical and geographical origin, you would have to a large number of things. If you are doing a DNA analysis, we would again need uh, very expensive equipment, infrastructure, competent uh, personnel to identify it, biostaticians to do the statistical analysis of it. For the adulteration or the authenticity of the sugars, IRMS is the gold standard, both combination of elemental analysis and the LCIRMS can be used. So each method has its own advantages and disadvantages, which we have to look at. For example, the botanical origin by doing it with DNA, if it is a filtered honey, you will get no DNA, so it cannot be done. So, Therefore, what is required for honey authenticity is a system and a holistic approach similar to that what is used in systems biology. Thank you. 
Thank you, ma'am, for being with us and joining us over here. And thank you for sharing the Indian perspective of honey in such a detailed way. So that was quite easy to understand, I hope, for everyone. And next, we would like to move on. And for that, I would like to invite that the next topic is fish authenticity. And uh, Dr. N. Bhaskar will come up over here to explain this in detail. And he's a regulator, scientist, researcher, advisor, QA, Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, New Delhi, from December 2016 to till now. And principal scientist at CSIR, CFTRI, Mysore, from uh, January 2010 till now. And scientist E1 CSIR, CFTRI Mysore from January 2006 till December 2009. Scientist C CSIR CFTRI Mysore, January 2002 to December 31, 2005. Scientist B CSIR a CFTRI Mysore from 1997 to December 2001. And here I would want to mention his fellowships at National Academy of Agriculture Sciences 2017, Corporate Fellow Society of Fisheries Technologists, India, SFTI 2015, Association of Food Scientists and Technologies, India, AFSTI 2015, and Society of Applied biotechnology sab 2011 and hereby further i would like to mention few of the awards received by dr n bhaskar and these are are as follows uas gold medal award 1993 professor hpc shetty gold medal award 1993 by uas bangalore best student award 1993 by afsti mysore best group for scientist award 2006 2007 by csir cftri mysore professor ms swami nathan best fishery scientist award 2006 to 2007 by pfgf mumbai Laji Goto Samrak Nidhi Award for Excellence in R&D 2010 by AFSTI Mysore. Japanese Government Scholarship 2002-2004 by Government of Japan. JP, JSPS Invitation Fellowship 2008-2009 and 2015-2016 by JSPS Government of Japan. So hereby he has received so many awards and we really congratulate sir for receiving and having so many you know elegant dignitary awards in your list in your heart so now with the invite sir on screen dr n bhaskar to uh, speak upon topic of fish authenticity can you please have the ab uh, good morning to all first of all i wish to thank aos india section for inviting me to be part of this virtual event on food authenticity and safety especially from the context of seafood farm uh, seafood uh, from among all the protein sources is a widely traded uh, commodity globally. Although the production is limited by boundaries, the consumption is truly global and uh, is beyond boundaries. The globally traded value of uh, seafood is in excess of uh, uh, US dollar 165 billion uh, in the year 2018 as per the figures of FAO. The seafood trade is quite uh, complicated and uh, uniquely diverse uh, as compared to any other animal protein sources because of the fact that uh, the trade comprises nearly uh, more than uh, 1800 edible species available across the globe which are commercially viable and traded including the fish and shellfish captured or cultured. The complexity of, of uh, this seafood trade actually entitles uh, the consumers to be deceived of many things which actually I would deliberate and I would elaborate uh, during the course of my presentation. So uh, that's the reason I have titled my presentation as Seafood Ford Kehasimos, the Indian scenario. And although uh, I have specifically spoke, uh, sp um, uh, spoken of the Indian scenario, the entire presentation is quite uh, applicable globally. And for the uninitiated, I would like to mention that the Kehasimos means what should we do in Spanish? Now, uh, before we begin, uh, I just would like to uh, you know, highlight uh, one of the comprehensive definitions available for seafood uh, that is available in the EU regulation. And it may, it, it defines seafood as all seawater and freshwater animals, whether wild or farm, and including all edible forms, parts, and products of such animals. This is one of the most comprehensive in my professional opinion. 
having said that, uh, let's look at uh, what does the production chain or the value chain of uh, aquatic fruits or seafood uh, involve? It involves an aquatic environment. The fish or the shellfish can be captured or cultured. And in either case, it needs to be transported. And the uh, captured fishes also provides a feed uh, resource for the culture operations. And it can be simply uh, primarily processed, for example, just eviscerated or descaled and then uh, stored and then uh, uh, sold for, or it can be sold as is just by washing and then icing the fish and then it is sold. And then it can also undergo secondary uh, uh, processing where there's a buyer involved or a processor involved. And it can be distributed through different channels. Either it can be food service, restaurants, retailers, or markets. And finally, it reaches the consumer. However, if you look at the entire operations, the only common factor you can see is the water. Having said this, now you look at the entire global seafood trade. Anything that is produced in India can be on a plate in Europe, in the US, in Mexico, in China, in Japan, or in Korea. Anything that is produced in Japan can be in India, in Sri Lanka, it can be in Bangladesh. So, which means it can happen, the production can happen locally, but the consumption can happen globally. Similarly, there are variety of commodities that are available for trade. And that here it includes more than 1,800 edible and commercially viable species. And these can be of extremely different uh, species, size, shape, taste, etc. Now, again, I say, from among all this, the most common factor, either from the production site or the harvesting site to the processing site or at the consumer table, the only common factor you can see is the water. Now, if you look at the net importers and net exporters across the globe, and I've just tried to highlight uh, the major importers and uh, major exporters of seafood uh, here. And uh, if you see more or less, uh, they're uh, the same thing. And uh, if you take India, we stand about at around about 8 to 10 position on the world top 10 uh, of exporters. And we are net exporters of seafood. So the export performance of Indian seafood between 12, 2012 and 16, I just thought I should highlight to the audience. You know, we have been growing in terms of seafood exports. And currently we stand at uh, around uh, uh, 7 billion US dollars which is quite a lot uh, considering uh, that we are uh, number two in aquaculture production and uh, we always hover around the fifth or sixth position in uh, capture fish production. Now, uh, having seen the complexity of the seafood trade, uh, the important thing that comes to mind, how do you know from where it is coming? So what is important in uh, the entire trade fraternity is to know from where it is coming. So that means, we need to establish the traceability of any of the commodity that is being traded. So uh, even in this case, I found the most comprehensive definition that is available is in the US EU regulations. And this is on, this defines the traceability as the ability to trace and follow a food, feed or food product, animal, food producing animal or substance intended to be or expected to be incorporated into food or feed. So all stages of production, processing and distribution. Now, having said this, let's put things into the perspective. Now, we know the seafood trade is complex. The seafood trade needs a traceability network. The seafood uh, trade involves uh, more than 1,800 species. Now, there is always a chance in any of these pieces, there is a chance of, uh, of frauding a consumer. So, what do you mean by seafood fraud? When you look at seafood fraud, generally people tend to think that mislabeling, misrepresentation, or substituting a species amounts to seafood fraud. But it also includes some practices in the processing or at the retail end, you know, over icing or excessive glazing in case of frozen vegetables, uh, or masking the origin, trying to tell that one, uh, trying to tell that the species is from one country, but sell a species from the other country. And then also use of unapproved additives. 
All these are considered as seafood fraud. Essentially, these are done to gain un, uh, 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 it's a, a very uh, deliberate economic uh, advantage or profiteering. So hence, this is also can be branded as economically motivated adulteration. Now, when you look at economically motivated adulteration, how much does it matter? As per one of the studies done in the US, from based on the data collected from the 1980s, since 1980s, you know, nearly 35% of the seafood uh, sold at the retail ends, uh, which is in the restaurants or in the retail chains, are found to be mislabeled. So, uh, which is going to uh, mean a lot in terms of consumer fraud. Similarly, even in the EU, it's a big problem. Nearly 40% uh, of the uh, mislabeling issues happen uh, in restaurants or retail outlets. Now, in, the, in terms of exporting countries like India, it also becomes a big problem, uh, especially from the image point of view of the country, as well as for the economic uh, disincentive when it is the consignment is rejected based on misstating or misrepresentation. So it has a problem for the export market too and also has an implication in the importing countries. Now if you look at the parameterized rejections of Indian seafood between 2012 and 2016, you see that nearly about 15% of uh, the rejections are based on seafood fraud issues. Especially when I say seafood fraud, I mean only the uh, mislabeling or an inappropriate additives used in a particular product. Now, why does it become so important? What is the cause and what are the effects? Now, if you look at it, there are three different issues that actually border and uh, are the main effects and the causes uh, uh, of seafood, seafood fraud. What the effect is actually on the public health and safety. The other effect is on the cost. And the, the third impact, the third, although it's third, uh, least but not the least, it's also an effect on the environment. And why do I say that? So, for example, when you look at the public uh, perspective, it can create health issues, it can create safety issues. For instance, uh, a species called an escola contains uh, a toxin called as jampylotoxin, which is also called an X-lax. This escola fish can be passed as one of the most expensive fish, like tuna. Similarly, there is a fish called as uh, tide fish, which can accumulate mercury. It can be passed as red snapper, which is one of the premium uh, species, which sells at uh, quite a huge uh, sums per kilo. Now, can anybody identify which fish is this? If you look at the left uh, one, it is the x lax or the escola, which contains jampylotoxin. On the right is the albacar tuna. Now, if you look at the preparation, when it is served, especially when it is battered or uh, uh, baked or battered and breaded or fried. Nobody can distinguish, even the connoisseur cannot distinguish between these two. So you would be defrauding a consumer with a very cheap fish, but also affecting his health with, uh, in the name of a premium fish. Similarly, if you look at these two uh, photographs, you see two fishes and two fillets. Now, if you look at the left one, it's a red snap over, which is highly expensive one. Whereas on the right side is about a style fish, which actually accumulates mercury. Now, it can cause health effect, but it is available for a cheaper price. It can be sold off or it can be passed off as red snap. Similarly, uh, like in the previous slides, a less expensive fish can be uh, provided as a, a highly expensive fish in the name of, uh, by just misrepresenting the uh, species and it can lead to unwanted or undesirable profiteering especially from the point of view of consumers so for example what you see on the up, uh, uh, top half and the bottom half can anybody tell us what kind of fish these are actually for somebody who actually is going to be served with a fried or a breaded or a battered fish of this they would actually the bottom one can pass off as the top one, the top one can pass off as the bottom one. Now, if you look at the top and this uh, one on the right side, this is the bottom one is cobia, which is one tenth of the cost of sea fish. The right one is basa, which is again about one eighth the cost of uh, uh, sea fish. So, essentially, you can pass off this 
as CEO fish by investing less and you can actually make a large amount of profit and you would be in the process defrauding defraud, like the consumer of uh, you know he would enjoy thinking that it is uh, CEO fish but you would be serving him either basa or kobia which means you are actually committing a fraud in the name just by misrepresenting two species similarly you look at red snapper the fillet and you look at the fillets from rockfish or the tilapia you can simply pass it pass the two which are uh, the one on the left side with the right uh, one uh, the two on the right side the uh, one on the right side actually are very less expensive and they can be passed as a highly expensive red snapper now for the benefit of the audience i have just uh, summarized what would be the cost offset actually if it uh, happens uh, so obviously the cost offset per kilogram would be to the tune of anywhere from minimum of four dollars to ten dollars which is a huge when you look at the amount of fish uh, that is traded across the globe. similarly uh, from the environmental point of view it can result in uh, illegal or unreported unregulated fishing and as per one estimate the iuu fishing uh, is to the tune of about 12 to 24 us dollar billion it's about 12 to 24 billions of us dollars and that's a huge sum and it can also encourage a uh, banned species for example this can anybody guess what uh, fishes these are the one on the left and one on the right the one on the right is basa and the one on the left is a traditional indigenous catfish of india now Initially, uh, the Vietnamese basa was passed off as the fillet of uh, sushi, and uh, fish was introduced into India illegally. Now, it has become a menace in the aquatic and uh, the fisheries ecosystem of the country. Similarly, if you look at the uh, catfish on the right side, these are African catfishes, and the one on the left side is a riverine catfish, which is indigenous to India. This is Clarius batracus, and these are Clarius garipinius and Icterus pumpkinus. Now, in the name of Clarius batracus, and due to introduction of these exotic species, the fisheries ecosystem in many of the rivers have been wiped out. And you have you hardly find uh, riverine catfishes, the Clarius batracus, to the tune very uh, to a very less tune compared to the one that is to be uh, found uh, previously. So uh, this particular aspect is so important from the point of view of environmental impact. Now, if you look at seafood fraud, it actually has a motive, has an effect, and it can finally result on the consumer in terms of frauding you. Now, what are the direct drivers? Because the commodities are diverse, and there are numerous species and there is a high global demand and there's huge gaps in privacy it encourages people to undertake seafood fraud so the effect is it can be on health it can be on the price especially on the pockets of the consumer and also on the environment similarly the indirect drivers for this seafood fraud are there are no incentives for the industry to be very honest and there are no uh, mechanisms to trace or there is no transparency available in the system to know what a particular FBO, the food business operator is. And also there is a very low prosecution as of now. And then there is also the detection mechanisms that are available is very poor. Now, there is also uh, enforcement being a state subject and uh, the uh, policy making is from the central uh, sphere it becomes important uh, that there is uh, 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 good coordination however which actually lacks when it comes to enforcement especially uh, in terms of seafood fraud now how this uh, seafood fraud can be addressed what are the feasible solutions and i i would say just play dart when i say dart it's not the board game that i suggest to play i mean by dart i mean determine the species determine the value determine the method of fishing and determine the origin of the species and authenticate the species, the correctness and the method of fishing and also the origin. 
then record it especially from the point of view of the bank the supplier the place the geographical area from which it is harvested and trace the entire value chain and again feed the trace the records into the recording so that you have a complete information chain which is based on traceability that you know how much was caught how much was transported how much was sold and what is the uh, total value that has realized from the entire operation now when you want to determine and authenticate stocks of populations as you all are aware uh, seafood is so diverse and it the uh, same species can be available in two different waters and they can differ and it can be established through many tools one of the tools is the geochemical tools and especially the trace elemental fingerprinting for instance the uh, mineral pattern on the scale or the autolith can be determined by trace element fingerprinting and it is very unique to a particular water so different stocks of fishes can be determined by this or different populations of fishes can be Similarly, you can also use fatty acid profiles as one of the tools, and also the protein profiling as one of the tools. And the more accurate one uh, uh, is uh, the DNA-based method. However, DNA-based method cannot distinguish the populations or the stock. So when I say uh, we have tools, they can be used comprehensively, in combination, is singly, depending on the situation. <coughs> Besides this, we can also use something called as DNA barcoding, and which I would explain uh, further in my future next slides. Now, before that, I would like to compare the methods available and the advantages and disadvantages. I would not completely go through, but uh, except that I would like to mention that the DNA based methods, the more sensitive, accurate, and specificity of the species can be very much achieved. However, it is very expensive, a lot of skill is required. On field applicability, Although now there are techniques that are coming that can be used on the field also, but it's, it's quite limited in terms of on-field application. So when, you, when I say DNA barcoding or DNA, I mean determine the necessary authenticity using the nucleotide DNA. So when we look for DNA to determine the necessary authenticity, we can use different tools even in the DNA-based methods. One of the DNA based method is just to look at genomic DNA and then use any of these methods. It can be restricted uh, uh, fragment length polymorphism or random amplification or forensically informative nucleotide sequencing or uh, amplified fragment length polymorphism. Now, I just would like to highlight some of the works that are actually commercially viable and that have been done reported across the world. So these are uh, different works that I have compared. And almost all these methods are very specific, but these are all based on genomic DNA. Now, the more specific method than this is also available. And now, before that, I would like to summarize different uh, genomic DNA based, based methods uh, here. And you can see I have just given, uh, uh, based on the publication of Ramus and uh, I have given the comparison of uh, all these uh, different methods. And these can be used for different families. And different groups of fishes. Now, if you look at uh, uh, authentication of uh, the species as well as the differentiation within the species, for example, there can be two different species of tuna. They can be differentiated, and for which DNA barcoding is the most preferred uh, method. Now, what is DNA barcoding? It is uh, first of all we need to understand what is a barcode. It has about eleven variable numbers. On positions with 10 possible numbers and we can assign nearly about 100 billion items with these numbers now what is a dna barcode now you determine a sequence and you determine the ideal sequence particularly specific to a particular species or subspecies and then use it as a barcode now, internationally, there is something called as International Barcode of Life. This is a website for somebody who would like to visit. And the target was 500,000 species. And they have met the target uh, to create a sequence of 500,000 species. And they have met the target on August 10, 2015. And this particular uh, Barcode of Life has developed Barcode of Life database. And for fish, 
it is called the fish barcode of life or the fish bowl and this is the website for somebody who wants to visit this now for this what they have done is they have defined the dna barcode region especially based on the cytochrome c oxidase subunit 1 they have preferred cytochrome uh, c oxidase 1 because it cannot be easily recombined and it lacks any uh, genomic uh, inference and the primers that are available for this particular uh, sequence is very robust and there are hundreds and thousands of uh, mitochondria cells where the copies of CY gene can be available in the sample. Hence, CY is the preferred one uh, for this uh, DNA barcoding. And essentially, it follows the same uh, process as I explained before, except that it works on the CY, the cytochrome oxidase subunit 1 gene. And then the sequence is done, and the specific sequence is barcoded. So, for example, I have just given uh, the barcodes for different species. Uh, the tuna, the escolar, the cod, the iridescent shark, haddock, or the red grouper. Uh, the target is about 30,000 fish species uh, for this uh, uh, fish bowl. However, uh, so far they have uh, sequenced about 8,000 species. But just authenticating the identity, uh, Shad, would it solve the problem of seafood fraud? I would say uh, no. Because uh, the methods are so expensive and not user friendly in terms of on field application. Hence, we need to look at different means. Are there any solutions? That's what we need to. So, though, I would like to now uh, highlight the overall solutions that we can think of in terms of addressing seafood fraud. Now, I would not get into the details of this as I've already explained. Now, with all this direct drivers and indirect drivers and the effect, I would like to say that seafood fraud can be addressed by resetting now when i say reset i mean the regulations and regulatory bodies the empowering of consumers and markets synchronizing with international standards educating the stakeholders and technical certification programs for all the stakeholders especially the industry operators now when i say regulations and regulatory bodies the best example i can i could think of was the us fda list of tradable uh, fish species with common names and accepted market names and that is available on the use of the website i'm just uh, showing you on the screen for the benefit of the audience and if you look at this is one of the most updated database and uh, this database as on date uh, was last updated in july 2020 and currently contains about 1960 plus species <coughs> similarly you can also look at uh, something uh, uh, called as fish base which is uh, hosted by FAO where you can verify the common name or the market name or the history or the biology or the stock uh, information or uh, the important uh, production information of a particular species in this uh, database and this can be made use especially through uh, by harmonizing uh, for harmonizing a lot of international standards. <coughs> The other thing is technical certification uh, programs and the best I can think of uh, is the Marine Steward uh, Ship Council where actually they talk about traceability of uh, from pond to the plate or from ocean to the plate. So this is something that actually can go a long way in terms of addressing seafood fraud. Now, is that enough? Now, I would say having done that, you need to eat to enjoy the best meal only when it comes with three C's. When I say eat to enjoy the best meal, I mean enforce to enable, enforcing to enable through graded penalty so that the FBO is first given a graded penalty so that he, they all fall in line or they do not venture into any of these unwanted practices. Also, all these graded penalties or the enforcement or enabling them has to come from uh, based on evidence which is scientific or technical and which is based on risk analysis or evidence analysis. And based on this, actually a minimum or effective auditable legislation can be formed wherein we can, uh, we need not have to restrict the competition. 
but we can implement a lot of non regulatory measures like you know good manufacturing practices best aquaculture practices etc and also try to have a regulatory list of tradable names uh, common names so that they do not misrepresent the species which actually eventually would lead to a consistent a compliant and a complete uh, ecosystem where you can address the entire issue of seafood fraud so that uh, when you eat your fish you will enjoy it to the tea with the best appetite and the best taste and you are assured that what you are eating is what you have asked for <clears throat> so summarizing the entire issue having seen the direct drivers indirect drivers and the effect and re using the different solutions available and resetting it you can actually educate and empower the consumer so that he is very much aware what he is eating or what is coming on his plate and he is very assured that he is not defrauded of things that he is not aware and with that i end my presentation and uh, some of the sources that i have used for my presentation are listed here and i would like to thank uh, my uh, chief executive officer for permitting me to be present uh, amongst you for this virtual mm -hmm. conference and i would like to thank uh, my friend uh, dr sangeeta for some of the uh, images and information uh, that i used in the presentation i also thank the organizers of this food summit which uh, basically enhances and talks about food authenticity and uh, food safety and to all of you for having been patient with me in uh, listening to uh, my uh, presentation thank you and i would uh, be happy to receive any of the questions or any of the discussions uh, through the organizers on the chat box and i am uh, willing to learn uh, from any of the information that you all would provide me and i am willing to clarify uh, any of the information that you see from me and if i am not able to reply you immediately i will definitely get back to you within a uh, very limited time i would be glad to do that thank you for coming here on the google call thank you very much for being patient with me uh, for this uh, presentation Thank you, Dr. Baskar, for being with us and explaining us in such an amazing detail about the fish authenticity. As we all know, it gets difficult at times to recognize these small detailings. And we are really grateful to you for explaining it really well with all the minute details over here. And with this, we would like to move forward. And next, I would like to invite over here uh, from the Dr. Milling Shots. And uh, she is currently a senior scientist, global analytical and food safety product stewardship for Abbott Laboratories nutrition business. Her primary responsibility is working closely with the suppliers and plans to run the contaminate program to ensure ingredient and product safety. She works with private organizations, government agencies, universities, and laboratories to ensure product quality and safety through use of globally harmonized fit for purpose test methods and standards. In addition, she works on method development, emerging issues, food safety, and sits on a committee for protecting our product. Mailing earned a BS degree in biochemistry with a minor in business from Florida State University and a PhD in food science and technology at the Ohio State University, Columbus, OH. So uh, I would now like to invite on screen Dr. Mailing Schatz, and uh, she'll speak up over here about adulteration and the impact it has on our industry. So can we have the AV, please? Hello, my name is Dr. Mailing Schatz. I work for Abbott Nutrition, and today I'll be talking about adulteration and the impact it has on industry. I'm going to give you a definition of economically motivated adulteration, which I'll call EMA, which is the intentional sale of substandard food or food products, for the purpose of economic gain. There's different types of definitions of EMA that you'll hear about with the intentional substitution of an authentic ingredient, the cheaper product, dilution, flavor, color enhancement, substitution for one species for another. 
but the basic aim of EMA is to inflate by fraudulent means. There are roughly seven types of food fraud that you'll most likely hear about from the FDA and different regulatory agencies, which would be substitution, concealment, mislabeling, theft and or diversion, unapproved enhancements, counterfeiting, and dilution. Mind you, there's still more than seven, but these seven are the most typical that you'll see. I kind of want to talk about intentional economic adulteration and the impact it's had on industry in the last 50 years and to kind of shape where it comes from to today. In 1977, this case was pivotal with Beech Nut. It's where the FDA revealed that this apple juice company that was supposed to be selling 100% pure apple juice actually was selling a mixture of beet, sugar, apple flavor, caramel coloring, corn, and corn syrup. This was the first time ever in the history of any adulteration case that the CEO slash president of Beech Nut and or any company was sentenced to jail and was also personally fined $100,000. The company itself was fined $2 million and had a class action suit of $7.5 million. In 1981, street vendors in Spain sold colza oil, which is a lubricant for machinery, to the customers as olive oil. Olive oil in Spain isn't typically consumed raw. They don't always cook it fully. They put it on salads. And this caused a larger issue of people getting sick due to toxic oil syndrome. Not just the fact that it was colza oil, but the fact that they used it without cooking out any other types of adulteration or seeing that it wasn't truly olive oil. This caused a lot of musculoskeletal issues that killed over 6,000 people in Spain. The World Health Organization has a lot of data on that if you're interested in this topic. In 2008, most of us remember the milk and infant formula adulteration scandal with melamine. It caused over $18 billion in fines, recalls, and reparations. Over 300,000 people became ill. More than 50,000 infants were hospitalized. And at that time, six infants had passed away. And to this day, out of those 50,000 infants, they still have medical issues that they're still addressing. In 2013, Honey Solutions and Grub Farm were fined $2 million in fines, and five of their individuals were charged for illegal importing and selling of adulterated honey. And this has actually caused a ban in the U.S. saying that honey cannot be imported from China anymore. In 2015, Cumin was adulterated with undeclared peanut products. This was a huge issue in over 700 different products recalled by 40 different manufacturers. So the peanut products were in tomato paste, frozen pizzas, and a lot of products used for spice and mixes that people didn't really think about, and that's how it really affected the industry in 2015. So these are some more recent ones. This was actually from November 9th, and talking about honey producers that are struggling with adulterating, adulterated imports because it's the worst harvest they've seen in decades. In addition, this article was from November 16th, talking about the GMO tech causes clashes among the Indian food sector. And if you read the article a little further, it also talks about adulteration and import issues. And one article that was from November 17th talks about the adulteration of Paneer and the cream destroyed during transit. So that kind of wants, wants me to lead into what the common adulterants were for 2019. In 2019, we had organic and non-GMO food and food products. I'm highlighting this because I'll be talking about it a little later in the types of mitigation strategies that I used to that we could use to protect against food adulteration. In addition, milk, oils, fish and seafood, honey, fruit juice, coffee and tea, spices, wine, and wheat. So the first one, which was organic versus non-GMO, we're going to discuss butter. So the organic food industry in the U.S. has kind of skyrocketed. In 2012, it was a $28 billion industry. In 2016, it was a $47 billion industry. Butter is the third most consumed organic product in the U.S. at $1.4 billion pounds a year. Butter prices in 2016 were $2,650 a ton versus in 2017 was roughly $6,000 a ton. 
The biggest differences in the organic versus conventional butter is the feed. So for organic butter, you have a non-GMO feed, grass silage and grains versus a conventional butter, you could use any type of GMO feed, corn and grain. One of my projects before was looking at the differences using vibrational spectroscopy with organic and conventional butter. I use three different types of near infrared spectroscopy to see the differences between the spectra and if we could classify them and separate them well by just using the spectra. Thankfully, we were able to see that there was really good separation between their inner class distances after collecting the spectra and using Simca. You can see that the organic and conventional butters fell into their separate classes and were easily identified. And a lot of this was also paired with fatty acid analysis to see the differences in the bands of actually trans fat between the organic and conventional butters, which really helped delineate the difference between classes. This is one step to show that you can use this type of mitigation strategy, strategy to protect against food fraud. Another topic that made it on the FDA's top 10 list and is a huge product that is commonly adulterated around the world is milk. So we can see milk being adulterated with water, detergent, starch, urea, melamine, formalin, vegetable oils, other synthetic milks, hydrogen peroxide, ammonia sulfite, chalk, salt, etc. The list just goes on. There was a project that I used looking at a non-targeted method with MidIR and able to see the different types of milk protein concentrates, not milk specifically. Um, this was using a mid-IR analysis, and we were able to determine the classification of the milk or mixture in less than a minute. The performance was accurate and reliable, and it was robust, and you can see how it falls into different classes. And if it wasn't a pure sample of the whey protein or the non-fat dry milk, then it kind of fell into these mixtures, which would be considered adulterant. Another project that I've worked on is actually honey. The U.S. consumes about 40 million pounds of honey a year. Only 48 can be supplied by U.S. and the rest has to be imported from 41 other countries. In 2001, the Fair Trade Commission banned the import of Chinese honeys since they were flooding the marketplace with cheap honey. And then again, we had talked about the 2013 Greb Farms was charged by the Department of Justice and had to pay a $2 million fine. In 2017, the American Beekeeping Federation approximated 28% of the honeys imported are adulterated. And this was a recent article posted in the EU about adulteration with sugar syrups and being most widely seen in honey adulteration. So common adulterants for honey on the list below and to the left is kind of a way you can tell if honey is adulterated really quickly. If you really want a really scary science project with your kids at home, you can hold a lighted match to the honey to see if it melts or if it starts to hiss. There's other things you can do at home if you're curious, just to kind of what they would call a poor man's uh, version to see how it's adulterated. The FDA um, claims honey is a food that can only contain honey and it must be named honey. And it can include the source of honey, such as clover or honey, on the label. The issue is because honey is a single ingredient food, you don't need to include an ingredient statement on the label. So if the honey is a mixture, it must be labeled blend of honey or corn syrup and corn syrup or raspberry flavored honey. So here are three different types of honey in ingredients packets on the back where you see just organic honey, pure honey and high fructose corn syrup or the high fructose corn syrup and all these other ones and that was actually a honey blend. So I did another project with looking at honey. On the left you see the AOAC method run on sugars for honey and on the right you actually see a ramen spectra that matches the same bands of the honey. The top two are pure honeys, 
the green one, the third one, is actually a honey sauce. And you can see the difference in the sugar profile with, a with the AOAC method with LC that matches um, to the ramen where you have oligosaccharides that you're not seeing in the first two that you're seeing right here in the ramen spectra that you don't get the clear delineation of. And then with the third one, you may have a sample that was labeled as pure, but there were oligosaccharides that were in it and it was actually adulterated honey that we saw in this particular case. I also ran Simca analysis on this as well. Um, we had pure honey show up and adulterated honeys. These were potential adulterants that I had classified, but I didn't see any in the honeys that I had ran. And there was also honey mixtures. Most of them fell into the adulterated honey list. So a honey mixture would have been the corn syrup plus honey or anything like this. The adulterated honey was 100% adulterated, so zero honey was actually in the honey itself. The nice thing about this analysis that we could use to mitigate food fraud is the fact that it's ramen and it's less than three minutes um, to get the spectra in order to see if it falls within one of these four buckets. In 2019, the food fraud, this was actually published by Food Protection to show different food frauds by the countries of origin. Now, mind you, these are the only ones that were caught. So the successful fraudster was not detected. So these are ones that were caught and reported. And these are the countries of origin in which the adulteration was had occurred. So the label said it came from France or Denmark or Canada, et cetera. Um, EMA is a global problem in roughly 600 million people, one in 10 in the world, will actually fall ill after eating a contaminated food and roughly 42,000 people die a year from that. Children under five years of age carry 40% of the foodborne disease burden with a parent with close to 125,000 deaths per year. A number of countries um, where the source of ingredients were listed are is how this was identified. And a recent EU commission analysis showed a 20% increase in reports of food fraud in Europe in 2019. So now we come to 2020 with COVID. So COVID adulteration has increased dramatically. We've seen alcohol in Mexico being adulterated, spices and meat in the EU, dairy and spices in India, infant formula and vitamins in China, strawberries in Australia, fruit out of Pakistan, uh, plant-based protein. things worldwide. We also have some things that were most commonly adulterated in the this past year due to COVID, which was turmeric, green chilies, seeds, paneer, ice cream, and coffee powder. So some of the things that I just kind of want to show you is that upon visual inspection of a product, some people can't tell the difference that actually uh, A is what you would consider a sugar and B is kind of soap shavings mixed in with a rock sugar and they were claiming it was rock sugar, but it was mostly soap shavings. So one of the things that we have discussed at length is looking at how you should visually inspect the ingredients coming into your facility to see if you notate a difference that could cause issues. This is rice that was adulterated with pieces of plastic. So once you boil the rice, you can see the rice did not turn white. But if you look at the rice on the left, it looks like rice you would typically see before you boil it. And the rice on the right is pure authenticated rice. Another difference you'll see is a difference in labels. So the first bottle is actually the bottle that is the authentic bottle. You can see bottles two, three, and four. There's a lot of differences, whether it is the picture on top, the way the font is lettered, um, where the P may be located, or the labeling of the year is different. It's down here on one and up here on another, or here and another. And the Grand Vin is 
in a different position as well. These were kind of just very dirty bottles to make it look aged and older versus this was a very clean bottle. And these are just things that you would see and people weren't noticing the differences of adulterated alcohol in Russia until someone put all four bottles together. So if you haven't drank this bottle before or you don't see it that often, the small details you wouldn't typically notice unless you were an avid drinker or perhaps in the wine industry. Another thing that we've been seeing due to COVID is a difference in the plastics or packaging, the size and shapes of the container that doesn't normally come in due to a limited supply or the supply chain having issues. So this one I wanna show you has a plastic wrap around it, uh, masking tape, where this one does not. Um, and then this one is fake because there's not supposed to have this wrapped handle. And the, they claim that they had the wrapping on the handle because the plastic was not the same type of plastic they typically use because they couldn't get the same packaging due to COVID. So small things that add up can cause a chain reaction down the road due to adulteration and its impact on industry. And unfortunately, not every company has the manpower in order to look through all these instances or situations to ensure that their products are 100% safe. So in conclusion, I just kind of want to wrap up that EMA is an issue and it is more prevalent and more concerning now that COVID has come back again with a vengeance and there's more border closures and supply chain constraints are becoming an issue yet again. There's a lot of evidence to show that food safety and food fraud are interlinked. Um, fat and oils became a top category based on the number of requests of placing olive oil um, in as a modified product. Uh, fish products are also followed around the world and meat products other than poultry. There's a lot of non-compliance with mislabeling and it's roughly 47% of what the violations are according to the EU. Uh, there's a lot of guidance from the health, World Health Organizations and Food Agriculture Associations with the United Nations to help identify um, new suppliers due to the short supply and unavailability to businesses due to COVID and the supply chain constraints. So if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to them in addition to your local agency. And with the increasing number of customers who are now turning to e-commerce, there's a larger concern for them buying products that are supposed to be, for example, Coca-Cola products or craft products, and those are adulterated because people now have time at home to kind of rethink and rework the system. So there's a lot more risk coming around these times and we need to have proper mitigation strategies to protect against food fraud. Um, my expertise is more on the non-targeted techniques to help with raw ingredients and identification before it gets into the supply chain of companies. But as an industry as a whole, we need to work together in order to prevent food fraud moving forward, especially in light of COVID. And with that being said, that is my conclusion. I hope everyone is healthy, well, and safe. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. And I look forward to meeting you all in person one day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mia. And uh, it was glad to have you here. And the way you explain, especially, it's very difficult to find adulteration in liquid things like milk and everything. And you explained it really well. And we are really thankful that you joined us over here. And now to all the viewers watching us, uh, you might be having some questions putting up in your minds that the, if you want to ask, you can now ask these questions because now we are going to start with the question and session. You can uh, write your uh, questions into the comment box that will reach to us and we'll flash it on the screen. And to give your answers, I will now like to invite on the screen. Start with Mr. Srinivas Joshi, President AOAC India section. Can you please uh, have you on screen, sir? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome. And uh, next, I would like to invite Dr. Saurabh Arora Treasurer, AOAC India section. Can you please have you on screen, sir? Hey, good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, 
And next, I would like to invite on screen Dr. Lalita Gora, recipient of Sir C. V. Raman Young Scientist Award for Life Sciences 1997. Can you please have you on screen now? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to this virtual meet. And now I would lead the screen to all of you to answer the comments. Uh, that is the questionnaire. So can you please have the questions? Thank you so much, Kanika. And uh, thank you, Dr. Lalita and uh, Srinivas. It's always nice to have everybody here. Uh, it's been a very nice session and uh, a healthy discussion has been going on in the chat. I think everybody has been participating quite actively there. Uh, so uh, we'll just take some of, uh, some of the questions which are already there. And uh, everybody who is online, you're please welcome to continue asking any questions you'd like to uh, us to address. We'll try and answer as many of them as possible right away. And if there is something that needs to be directed to the experts who are not here, because we're all in different time zones, so we will be uh, sending across these questions to them and they will uh, share their answers uh, you know, by email and we will get back to you on the website. So uh, I think the first question that we can see on our screen is from uh, Dr. Nilagdi. And uh, uh, Dr. Lalita, I think you will be uh, the best person to answer this. Yeah, as it is to the honey of city. So Dr. Nilagri is asking that uh, Manuka honey is again a high value product available through different online platforms. And is there any regulatory mechanism in India to check for the authenticity of the Manuka honey being sold online? Um, yeah. uh, thanks for that question. Um, no, we do not have any regulatory, uh, re any regulations. Oh. Our regulations only uh, say, uh, the carvo, carvosa calosa honey, or if you label it as unifloral, means from a particular plant species, your pollen count has to be totally in the total pollen count, 45% or higher must be there or multifloral. We do not have any regulations for uh, uh, to check whether it is manuka honey. Okay. Another question from Niladi again. Are there any authentic procedures for uh, stingless? Uh, uh, yeah. As I clearly indicated, very few countries have got uh, regulations for stingless bee honey. India doesn't have a regulation. Neither does EFSA have a regulation, nor does FDA have a, a regulation. I have found the regulation only in Malaysia and uh, uh, Australia. Uh, actually, the stingless bee honey has a higher moisture content and it also has a higher maltose content, but it is produced in very small quantities compared to the honey bee honey because these stingless bees are very small. Uh, maybe they are less than one third the size of the honey bee. Okay. So another question from Devi Sharma, how many minimum parameters can be determined for finding geographical origin of honey? Uh, well, uh, this is a difficult question to answer, as you could see from my presentation. And I said, there's not a single parameter that you can use yeah. uh, because uh, honey is quite uh, uh, complicated. For geographical origin, as such, I have not seen um, any parameter because I did not come across studies uh, showing principal component analysis of uh, different uh, geographical uh, regions. Mainly, currently, I think it is the floral, uh, whether it is unifloral or uh, multifloral. If you have to do geographical origin, you need to analyze at least 400 to 500 samples of honey across the world and, uh, uh, you know, use some of these parameters. Maybe the amino acids, as I said, because uh, um, cysteine and methionine content, you know, in some of the European honeys is missing. Whereas uh, in the other honeys, you find it. So uh, uh, this is a tedious and a cumbersome uh, task, but I'm sure people are do, doing it for uh, the honey analysis. At least 400 to 500 samples have to be analyzed. Great. So, a question from uh, Dr. Anu Krishnan. So uh, whether we have any performance criteria in the AOAC for methods pertaining to food authenticity? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We, we we do. 
we do we do have the performance criteria for the targeted as well as non non targeted authenticity testing so this is a part of a program which is ongoing wherein uh, you might have seen dr parmar orlandi's presentation wherein he explained uh, these criteria are already defined and it's a uh, uh, there is a smpr also for the uh, targeted authenticity standard method performance requirement so uh, uh, the more information uh, pertaining to the performance uh, criteria pertaining to the various technologies we will try to get uh, try to get more information and try to get back to you on this but uh, the the first point of answer yes aoc has the performance criteria for this another common question which was there uh, during the discussions i was looking at the chat as it was going on uh, is that you know it seems that for any work to be done on authenticity uh, the availability and collection of the standard uh, you know uh, specimens authentic specimens of these different products uh, that uh, seems to be a common challenge so uh, how do you feel uh, you know this should be approached with the indian perspective how we can work together and uh, maybe avc india can play a role in facilitating this so uh, uh, dr lalita uh, what is your opinion on this and the general practice towards this yeah. when we are talking about uh, authenticity or uh, in, uh, for honey as such authenticity see to uh, address the production authenticity we have methods that is uh, by doing the c12 or c13 uh, so that adulteration of sugars uh, is there but to uh, address the botanical and geographic origin as i said if we use the pollen count which is i mean the pollen microscopic uh, thing which is very authentic we need to have a database we need to uh, have a database of all the pollen micrographs uh, of the flowers in the country which the honey bees could use then we need to have a database of all the honeys Uh, or a fingerprint of all the honeys that are produced across the uh, country i don't think we can have a certified reference material because the certified reference material would uh, uh, just uh, you know tell you a particular honey but yes if you want to test and say this is manuka honey you can get authentic manuka honey and use that as a base uh, fingerprint so for many of these like particular honeys if you are sure of the source then you could get it in addition i want to say we are also trying to put up the methods in this regard for the nutraceuticals and the thing where that is humongous because we have so many herbs and thing but there you know we are looking at you know certified reference materials would be available because those herbs are um, defined they they know it it is uh, not something that is uh, traded uh, you know across because it is mainly for the labeling pur purposes but honey because it is a traded commodity and this geographic origin we need to have i mean as a researcher i would say you need to pick up the uh, get the authentic samples and as uh, i think professor elliot said you know if anyone is interested for doing the thing they can submit their samples and so maybe in this way we can increase the uh, authenticity database whether it be for fish or for honey or for any other commodity yeah. thank you so uh, dr joshi would you like to uh, add upon that she was uh, whether we can uh, you know how you feel maybe we can facilitate that and how the labs and members of uh, AVC India, we could all work together towards this, you know. Hello, yeah. Mr. Joshi. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I, I missed the half, half of a uh, okay. sentence. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I was asking that, uh, how do you feel? Uh, maybe AVC, the members and the labs and everybody who's part of this, you know, we could facilitate uh, with. Uh, getting the authentic samples or the samples together yeah de def definitely we can we can really act a bridge between say for around chris elliot's lab and the, the indian uh, 
Indian authorities who are really interested in uh, some uh, some kind of uh, collaboration with Chris Lab, or what they were, uh, what Chris was really explaining that any kind of samples uh, for the authenticity, they can always uh, write an email to him. And and also also in in terms of uh, any initiative pertaining in indian stakeholders uh, what we feel is we can we can have a discussion again with the aoc international pertaining to the food authenticity methods program which is which has been started in 2019 and in 2020 also it is in progress we can get few more insights from that and we can initiate some initiative in india uh, and yes. especially uh, as far as I know, uh, there, there are absolutely all the protocols for the targeted authenticity testing, but uh, I need to really check on the non-targeted authenticity testing uh, in terms of the performance criteria and other things. Great. This is a question from uh, Pintu Bhattacharya, uh, whether the similar to fish authenticity are data on meat products also available? Yeah, just to answer this, you know, the uh, authenticity of fish is very different from that of meat because in terms of fish, we are looking at species. Uh, like Dr. Baskar uh, explained, you know, you have so many fish, freshwater, uh, sea salt water, uh, etc. But in the case of meat products as such, this uh, question will not arise. You know, it is uh, either you're not looking at uh, the sheep variety or the goat uh, species because the genus is one and uh, uh, it does not vary much across the uh, uh, world but uh, I'm sure there must be I cannot answer this question because I'm not an expert on this but I'm sure there must be some databases because now next generation sequencing the NGS sequences sequencing has come in and I'm sure there are databases where it shows you, uh, you know, a DNA profile or DNA barcoding by which you can uh, identify the uh, species variation. Because in meat, we do not uh, have uh, that many, you know, like in terms of sheep or in goat or uh, beef, uh, unlike uh, the fish, uh, you know, which is so different. I'll just add there, uh, you know, because uh, the meat species identification, as ma'am said, is relatively simple because we're looking at a limited number of uh, types of meat. So you can have cow, buffalo, goat, chicken, you know, uh, rabbit meat is also official. And uh, so it is quite easy to do this. Even there are kits available and real time PCR assays, and even the standard meats and the extracted DNA samples are also available as reference material. This all came into focus after the horse meat uh, uh, story which occurred in Europe and after this I think uh, the at least the meat species identification has been uh, quite well uh, standardized and you can buy the standard DNAs, uh, standard meats and even the mixtures with the percentage levels are available from reference material providers. So it should not be a challenge to uh, take care of that. Uh, another question uh, we'll take uh, this is from Dr. Ajit Dua. She is asking that uh, 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 are there any standard method performance criteria for isotopic signatures uh, methods for honey? So she, I, I don't think a AOAC has started yeah. Uh, yeah. that. Yeah. And I think yeah. uh, the isotopic uh, ratios uh, vary. They, they would yeah. uh, vary from um, place to uh, place as well as uh, on the plants that the honey, uh, the honeybees collect their uh, nectar from, uh, depending on whether they are following the Calvin cycle, that is the C3 cycle or uh, the uh, C4 uh, cycle. But uh, I don't think the, currently there is any fingerprinting, although people are, uh, there are several publications where the C12 by C13 ratio is being uh, published, but I have not seen any database where uh, this um, finger, um, fingerprint or thing is uh, related. Because you can have a flower, the same flower, 
uh, say if you're you're saying the eucalyptus in India, and you can have the eucalyptus in um, uh, Australia, and you will get a different C12 by C13 ratio. C13. Okay. Agreed. So uh, uh, one more question. I, in fact, I'm adding it uh, based on what people are asking. That uh, there's a common thing that uh, you know the uh, especially in honey. Uh, when we talk about requirement for C3, C4 level of testing, this is uh, for very sophisticated fraud. Uh, whereas at a common level, maybe at a village or city level, we even have people just selling sugar syrup, uh, dissolving sucrose, mixing it into a high concentration and selling it. So, uh, ma'am, are these kind of uh, simpler adulterants, not very sophisticated adulteration being done? I think these can be tackled by our routine chemical tests as well. We don't need to go up to C3. Before. Yeah, yeah. You you can uh, uh, do this. Several methods are available. For example, you can even do the enzyme activity. Uh, if you check at the enzyme activity, the enzyme activity va varies as well, uh, for it. And in fact, uh, one of the targets now for uh, checking the uh, adulteration with sugars is to uh, check at the. Uh, I think it's a uh, uh, glucoamylase or one of those enzymes which uh, varies uh, uh, depending on the uh, thing. But what happens is when they add uh, syrups or anything like this, even these enzyme activities uh, will uh, get uh, destroyed. But there are, are methods where uh, they, they have used simple, I think, maybe simple amino acid analysis, free amino acid analysis. If you have a profile of the free amino acid uh, analysis, of the different uh, uh, honeys and some ratio you can do, uh, it should be uh, available. But uh, free amino acid analysis, as I said, along with some chemometric. Yeah. Okay, yeah. when we're doing authenticity, this uh, statistics is very important. So you need to have somebody who has expertise, uh, you know, a statistician a bio, uh, who can do the chemometric or you should have programs for the uh, PCA or for the LCA or for the hierarchical cluster and you will be able to tell it. But you can uh, do it by simple uh, methods. Actually, the HMF, no, hydroxymethyl furfural test, is also one of the tests to show whether it is uh, adulterated. Uh, you could also check the ratio of fructose and glucose uh, if you do it because that also is a method by which, you know, if you do several honey samples, you will come to know about the uh, adulteration. Great. So, thank you so much. I think that's all for our uh, question and answer session uh, for now. Please uh, continue asking questions. And we have Dr. Uh, Dr. Simon Herod also there in the chat. I see is very actively answering questions. So, please, uh, thank you, Simon, uh, for doing that. And uh, please keep on with this healthy discussion. Uh, I think we will hand over to Kanika for uh, yeah. Okay, so thank you uh, so much, all of you, for uh, being with us over here and answering all the questions with so much of dedication and deep explanation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Srinivas. Joshi ji, thank you, Dr. Saurabh Arora, and thank you, Dr. Rata Gobra, for joining us over here. And uh, now, as we are uh, taking forward this virtual meet, it's time for a lunch break. And this is Anka Kiran taking a small lunch break on this virtual meet. And we will see you over here right after exact 15 minutes. That is at 2.15 p.m. So see you all after lunch. Just be here at 2.15 p.m. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to AOAC International India Section Presence Virtual Conference Meet on Food Authenticity and Food Safety Conference, even supported by FSSAI and our technical partners are about. And I'm your host for this uh, virtual conference. My name is Kiran Vaswani. And we are going ahead uh, thus with the second part, that is the post-lunch of this conference and uh, post lunch we are going to talk about here sustainable food safety through capacity building and for this we have the speaker over here dr samuel godfroy from university of level canada dr samuel godfroy is the former director general of health canada's food directorate canada's food standard setting body and a former vice chair of the fao who codex Elementarius Commission. Samuel is currently full professor of food risk analysis and of regulatory policies in the Department of Food Science, Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences, University level, Quebec QC, Canada, and is leading the development of a food risk analysis and regulatory excellence platform hosted by the Institute of Nutrition and Functional Foods of University Laval. Professor Godfrey currently serves as a senior food science and regulatory expert on a number of advisory bodies and committees domestically and internationally, including on the International Advisory Committee of the China Center for Food Safety Risk Assessment. Professor Godfrey also serves as a strategic and operational advisor to international food safety capacity building Initiatives focused on regulatory enhancement implemented by the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, that is UNITO, and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO. Professor Godfrey is the founder and the current president of the International Society of Food Regulatory Science, a non-for-profit organization incorporated in Canada, with the aim to promote food regulatory science disciplines at the international level. Dr. Godfroy assumed senior food regulatory positions at the executive level with Health Canada for over 15 years. And here Dr. Samuel Godfroy will talk about sustainable food safety through capacity building. Can we please have the AV? I would like to thank the organizers of the annual meeting of the AOAC India section for their invitation. It's a privilege for me to contribute to the program uh, of this uh, year's event, uh, speaking about uh, the importance of integrated food safety capacity building initiatives and calling for regional investments. Uh, during this talk, I will uh, be positioning uh, the importance of investing in food regulatory systems as a prerequisite to enhance the food safety capacities of the food production sector. And uh, I will be advocating for regional investments in certain areas of capacity building. When we speak about food safety, um, we know that it is a shared responsibility involving both the industry, consumers, but also regulators. Regulators are uh, playing an important role because they receive a delegation of authority on the part of consumers to act on their behalf and uh, regulators make the decisions uh, in order to manage the relationship between consumers and producers food producers and also to level the playing field uh, amongst the food uh, the actors of the food production uh, sector uh, it is important that regulators operate in a manner that provides a predictable environment and supports the development of the food and agri-food sector. And in this regard, the Codex Alimentarius Commission provided some guidance as to the best practices of the Food Competent Authority through the guidance uh, and the principles it uh, offered uh, on the design and operations of food control systems. In summarizing those requirements, in order for a competent authority to operate uh, with an effective uh, set of measures, it needs to anchor its programs, its decisions on a robust legislative and regulatory framework. 
The predictability comes from a consistent decision-making framework based on the risk analysis uh, paradigm, the risk analysis principles, risk assessment, risk management, risk communication. And there is a need uh, to have a collaboration between the various partners supported by a robust governance. Of course, a competent authority cannot operate unless it is based on functioning institutions, but also uh, given that food safety is uh, based on scientific disciplines, we need to have a strong scientific capacity, including a capacity to analyze food. So essentially, uh, the food analytical capacity is an important component of a good functioning food competent authority. Now, uh, to paraphrase Codex, uh, the definition of a food control program are the collective actions and activities that uh, are uh, set in order to manage specific food safety hazards to assure the quality, the safety of food, and to support fair practices in the food trade. And an effective food safety competent authority is one that anchors its actions and its operations in this robust legislative framework that bases its decisions on the application of the risk analysis principles that ensures effective regulatory operations, both for standard setting and compliance and enforcement, and that has an enabling uh, set of operations, scientific capacity for risk assessment, laboratory operations, as well as the ability to communicate about risks. A number of these uh, functions in order to be developed require important levels of investment. Uh, investing in competencies takes time and takes money. Uh, in Investing in the generation of data, uh, the availability of data, which is essentially a key element to support risk assessment, uh, which is again um, the element that is needed to underpin decisions, uh, risk management decisions. All this requires time and money. Now, any investment that is made in a food production sector in a manner to enhance its food safety capacity, either through uh, the adoption of uh, enhanced uh, food safety standards to be followed by industry, uh, or uh, through uh, specific investments across the supply chain from primary production up to the retail level, any type of these investments need to be supported in parallel by regulatory enhancements. The investment in the food regulatory capacity needs to come hand in hand with the investment in driving uh, food safety practices of the food and agri-food production sector. And speaking about these investments in enhancing food regulatory uh, capacities, given the costs, given the time that it takes in order to build those food regulatory functions, being able to make such capacity building investments in a regional uh, framework would allow to maximize the return on investment, but also would be able to create economies of scale and uh, would enable us to reach the uh, sought after uh, objectives in a shorter period of time. These are some of the areas where a um, regional investment would be most beneficial. Certainly, in those areas where there is a strong element of scientific capacity and competency building, where there is also a strong level of investment in the availability of data. Risk assessments, the development of standards, the coordination of policies and uh, uh, related to compliance and enforcement, but also the creation of common mechanisms for incident management and information exchange. Those are elements that can be invested, um, that can be developed at a regional level and would offer opportunities when developed as such. And in this regard, I would like to share with you um, an experience that was implemented in the Arab region through an initiative uh, funded by the Swedish International Development Agency, implemented by the United Nations Industrial Development Organization in collaboration with the League of Arab States and two of its subsidiary organizations, and that uh, aimed uh, in uh, creating a favorable food regulatory environment to support the development of 
food and agri-food trade capacity within the region. I will uh, let you review this video and then I would like to come back and comment on a few aspects uh, related to regional food safety capacity investments. In January 2016, the Arab Food Safety Initiative for Trade Facilitation SAFE was launched with the overall mission to coordinate and possibly harmonize food safety regulatory measures in the Arab region, aiming for the enhancement of health and safety of Arab consumers and to enhance intra-regional trade in food and agri-food commodities, which in turn will reap benefits on Arab economies. 18 Arab countries were part of the journey, with the funding offered by the Swedish International Development Agency, SIDA. This initiative was implemented by the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, NIDO, in partnership with the League of Arab States and its subsidiary organizations, the Arab Industrial Development and Mining Organization, and the Arab Organization for Agricultural Development. With the important collaboration of representatives of the food production sector, mainly the Arab Union of Food Industries and the Arab Federation for Food Industries. SAFE has achieved both institutional and technical breakthroughs, starting with the creation of a regional food safety governance structure under the auspices of the Pan Arab Free Trade Agreement, or PAFTA, called the Arab Task Force for Food Safety, or ATF. Throughout the life of the project, the ATF oversaw five initiatives led by five technical working groups, each under the leadership of an Arab country. Jordan, Lebanon, the Arab Republic of Egypt, the Kingdom of Morocco, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. These initiatives resulted in practical tools contributing to building blocks of convergent food regulatory measures such as 1. The issuance of Arab guidelines for a rapid alert system for food and feed which aims to structure and fast-track information exchange related to food and feed safety incidents in the Arab region. Second, the coordination of Arab Codex initiatives with the development and issuance of guidance to enhance effective participation in Codex proceedings. Three, competency enhancement and talent development through a network of Arab food risk assessment experts. Four, a guideline on the development and adoption of a common food import export certificate to be used in Arab countries and five, the adaptation of the International Food Control Assessment Tool and the identification of priority food safety investments into Arab countries. At the institutional level, the ATF was anchored in the League of Arab States governance as decided by the Economic and Social Council of the League, adopting the ATF as one of its organs along with an SPS TBT committee. This initiative was implemented while ensuring gender balance in all events and activities that were organized. SAFE also powered targeted country-driven initiatives in several countries with specific agreements to enhance food safety performance in Egypt and Palestine. In Egypt, SAFE contributed to the initial institutional and program development of the newly created National Food Safety Authority NEFSA with an emphasis on capacity and competency development. In Palestine, the agreement with the Ministry of Health contributed to enhancing food inspection control systems. These efforts supported making food safety as a top agenda item for Arab senior decision and policy makers. SAFE continued to look to sustain and consolidate the investments made to date through the commitment of all the initiative's partners to continue towards building a common food safety regulatory environment in the Arab region. There is a significant value added uh, in uh, these regional approaches. The ability to share resources, particularly in uh, generation of data, for example, the design and implementation of monitoring and surveillance programs, the ability to rely upon consumption information, food consumption information, so critical uh, to risk assessments. The ability also to direct some targeted research, for example, uh, to look at the effectiveness of food safety mitigation measures when they are applied in a context that is specific to the region or to the set of countries 
where these are being investigated. The other benefit is that through these investments, we are driving at the same time towards convergent or harmonized food regulatory measures, which in and by themselves would limit and reduce the amount of technical barriers to trade and differences in sanitary and phytosanitary requirements between the different countries that are involved in these investments. At the same time, we are able to maximize the return on investment in competency development, and we are able also to target certain uh, investments in a manner that is complementary between the various countries of a given region. This generally uh, results in a stronger uh, stance for the region, particularly in international standard setting forums, such as the Codex Alimentarius Commission, through a better coordination of the positions of these countries involved in this region uh, to present, uh, for example, in the context of the uh, discussion of a, an international standard. Now, of course, these investments require also multiple facets of uh, areas of focus. First of all, uh, we need to invest in uh, competencies that is needed for risk assessment. We need to invest in data and data requires generally good food laboratory operations. And this is what uh, we have been trying to promote in a modest uh, fashion through the platform of food risk analysis and regulatory excellence of Université Laval and through the integration of the International Food Safety Training Laboratory. Uh, this is uh, a capacity that um, was uh, integrated in the platform's operation uh, in 2019 with the objective to offer training in major food analytical methodologies and protocol using uh, chromatography-based techniques and through the collaboration of uh, the Waters Corporation. We consider that this level of investment will allow us to uh, contribute in the availability of data through, of course, uh, a stronger capacity of food laboratory operations in the various regions where such capacity building programs are considered. We are hopeful that these investments will allow uh, the availability of stronger competencies to address um, multi-residue pesticide analysis, multi-residue veterinary drug analysis, but uh, also that will allow to strengthen certain food regulatory functions such as compliance and enforcement where uh, food laboratory analysis is so critical to provide the evidence needed for decisions and uh, protocol and uh, we're um, hoping again that through these measures that we will uh, enable uh, better opportunities for effective food safety regulatory programs which are so key to ensure uh, the protection of consumers, but also to provide that uh, enabling environment for the investment uh, in the food and agri-food business. Of course, none of this will be uh, possible unless there is a collaboration amongst all the stakeholders, the academic uh, centers that we represent, with multiple academic centers that we're trying to develop collaborations with around the world, with the uh, food industry, with the service providers, uh, as well as with the food regulators and the representatives of the consumers community. Once again, thank you for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak at this forum. And Thank you, Dr. Samuel Godfroy. Um, as he said, collaboration is everything. So this point has been noted and with the, all the details about it, thank you for so much of detailing. And here we move on to the next topic by Mr. Tom Seppert about Nutrition USA. Mr. Tom Seppelt is the Director of Product Stewardship and Food Safety at Abbott Nutrition, a division of Abbott Laboratories. He has worked in food safety and chemical contaminant analysis for over 30 years. In his current role, he is responsible for the development of global food safety programs, ingredient and packaging chemical risk assessment, and management of the emerging issue program. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Forensic Chemistry from Ohio University. So here I will invite Dr. Tom Sheeplet 
to speak on importance of monitoring melamine and cyanuric acid in milk and milk products. Can we please have the AB? Well, I'd like to start with saying thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, I'm sorry that it has to be virtual and I'm not able to be there in person. Uh, I was looking at the calendar and in November last year, I was actually in India working with laboratories in Mumbai and Bangalore. And then in November this year, I'm not, not able to travel. So it, it, 2020 is a, a very different year and I'm sorry I'm not able to join personally. Uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to talk about food authenticity and food safety. And uh, just a brief introduction to myself. My name is Tom Seipeld. I work for Abbott Nutrition. Uh, we're based in Columbus, Ohio in the US. I've been with Abbott for about 35 years now and been working in food safety and, and chemical contaminant testing uh, most of that time. When we talk about food authenticity, uh, we can also talk about food adulteration. Food authenticity is the positive aspect. We wanna verify the identity, the integrity of the food, make sure that it is what we want, that it has the right nutritional content, that everything is good. Food adulteration is the other side of that coin. We're really trying to do enforcement type activities. We're looking for things that aren't supposed to be there, things that are not the right quality, things that, um, in the case of adulteration, they may have been added intentionally. It, it's different from a contamination event where something might get into the food by accident. Adulteration, people are typically adding things or changing the food intentionally. Often that's modified by economics. They, they might dilute the food. They might add something else to it to try to increase its apparent value. Uh, could be a color, could be a different type of flavor. Um, but they're really doing it to try to, to fool the buyer and, and to make the buyer pay more than what the product is actually worth. <clears throat> Food adulteration is an ancient problem. It's been around for uh, almost as long as we've had written history. Uh, it was uh, present in ancient Rome and Greece, uh, documented cases of wine adulteration where it was either diluted or perhaps herbs or spices were added for flavoring. Sometimes even lead was added as a preservative, um, which then, of course, created other safety issues. So, so food adulteration is not new. Um, but what has been new in the last 12 years, really, since 2008, is a very acute awareness of the potential for these adulteration events to not just be economic, but to actually cause food safety implication. Uh, the melamine incident in China, um, we'll talk a lot about that and, and what drove that, um, but, but that really changed the way that we approach food safety and food adulteration and the way that we test food and, and the way we try to monitor to, to assure that the food is the quality that we need, that it's the safe product that we need. <clears throat> um, when people are trying to do things for adulteration, um, you can never underestimate their creativity. As soon as we find a way to detect what they're doing, they're going to find another way. Um, so we always have to be vigilant. We always have to be flexible uh, to try to predict what they might do to try to stay on top of what they might be doing. Melamine really hit the news in 2008. It was an unknown, previously unknown, um, food safety and food adulteration issue. Um, in 2008, the headlines really started to explode when melamine started to be detected in infant formula. It was in milk powder, which was then used to make infant formula. And in China, there were hundreds of thousands of infants who were made ill. Uh, several actually died. Um, so it, it became a real problem. Um, as I said, it was previously unknown. So there was a lot of effort that went into trying to understand what was happening. How did this get into the food? Um, 
how could we prevent it? Um, so, so it was a very dynamic process for about 18 months. After that, we, we began to understand what the problem was and it kind of went into a routine monitoring mode after that. We'll talk about why melamine was added. Um, and I said that people who are committing food adulteration can be very creative and they can be very smart. Melamine was added um, by some smart people who were trying to fool the system but it continued to be used by people who really didn't, did not understand why it was being used. Um, in the lower left here, you can see that melamine powder was actually added to animal feed so that it, it was fed to cows and got into the milk that way. Um, it became known as protein powder. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about why melamine is associated with protein. But because of that association, the, the farmer who didn't really understand the science and the chemistry behind it used it to enhance the milk. They didn't know why, but they knew that it could be there. What we've seen in the last 12 years is that this continues to be a practice that pops up every now and then. Despite all the issues with melamine, uh, milk powder or protein powder is still known and uh, occasionally we'll get back into the supply chain. So we continue to have to monitor and be vigilant. So how did melamine come to be and how did we find out? Um, it really started several years before we found it in the, in the human food chain and, and found it in infant formula. It was found first in pet food. Um, it was, uh, there were multiple incidents where dogs and cats were dying after being fed the pet food. And it took several years to really figure out what was going on. In 2007, the detection of melamine was, was finally made and, and the, the connection of melamine to the, the pet deaths was finally starting to be drawn. And as that was just beginning to be figured out, it appeared in China in infant formula. And so we found that it was being added intentionally to diluted raw milk. And it artificially then inflates the apparent protein value. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. What was happening though, is that as melamine was being detected and the people who were committing the adulteration added a little and, and they got away with it. And so they added a little more and they got away with it. And after a while, it got high enough that it started to cause food safety problems. People started getting sick. And there were about 300,000 Chinese infants and six fatalities in the first six or seven months of this incident. It represented one of the largest deliberate adulteration events that was known at the time. And it really changed the way we address the food safety system. The impacts <clears throat> to the China milk industry continue today. FSSAI still has a ban on, on China milk products. Um, and so the long-term implications were severe. The, the infant formula company, the milk company called San Lu in China that was associated with the event is now out of business and uh, many of their executives were um, convicted of the crime. So why melamine? Why was it added to the milk? The chemical structures are shown here. And, and the most important thing to point out is the high amount of nitrogen. Six, over 60% by weight of melamine is nitrogen. It was added to artificially elevate the apparent protein value. Um, the Keldahl nitro, uh, method for protein analysis actually measures nitrogen. It's not a direct measurement of protein. So by adding nitrogen, a nitrogenous compound to the milk, it inflated the apparent content of the protein. By doing that, they were able to dilute the milk and, and sell it uh, at a significant price increase. So it was a very profitable adulterant. Melamine is very common. It's used as a plastics monomer. It's, a, it's used in some food coatings. So as regulations were being developed 
we had to account for the allowed uses of melamine because traces might be present in the food. Same thing with cyanuric acid. It, it was related to the safety issues uh, uh, with melamine. It's a closely related compound. It can be a degradation product of melamine, uh, but it's commonly used as a chlorine stabilizer. So when we're doing water treatment for food use or for drinking water, cyanuric acid can be present to stabilize the hypochlorite that provides the chlorine to, to do microbial control of the water. Um, it's also a common chemical for swimming pools. So both melamine and cyanuric acid are very common um, fairly readily available uh, compounds. Because there are allowed uses in food contact or in food itself, either of these compounds might be present at trace levels in food. The real problem became when, when these were used as adulterants and the levels became much higher. So from a, a chemistry and toxicology standpoint, why did this become a food safety problem? Again, the, com the structures for melamine and cyanuric acid are shown. The two compounds, as they get more concentrated, begin to form hydrogen bonds and they're insoluble. Uh, the, this aggregate, the melamine cyanurate aggregate, is insoluble. So if these are ingested and then as they're trying to be excreted through the kidney, they begin to concentrate in the kidney as water is removed to concentrate the urine. They form crystals and actually in the kidney itself, you begin to get crystal formation and kidney stones. Um, so this aggregate then caused renal failure and that's why some of those children died and that's why so many were sick. From a toxicological standpoint, Melamine has been reviewed by JECFA, the European Food Safety Authority, US FDA, and TDIs for these compounds have been established ranging from 0.2 to 0.6 milligram per kilogram body weight. The important thing to note though is that there aren't data available to allow a calculation of a TDI when there is cyanuric acid present. The formation of these crystals really has not been studied enough to know what acceptable levels might be. And so in general, we take a zero tolerance approach. If melamine is present as an adulterant or even as an allowed part of the food use, we need to make sure that cyanuric acid is not present so that we're not causing unforeseen uh, food safety problem here. Just to make sure that we understand the overall impact of the melamine issue in 2008, the range of, of concentrations that were found in various food types, it was not just related to milk or milk powder. It was not related to just infant formula. It showed up in multiple food types, um, things that contained uh, other dairy ingredients, um, candies, uh, baked goods, all kinds of different things. And the global nature of the supply chain really is shown on the right hand side there because it, it was really an issue that seemed to be isolated to China where the adulteration events were taking place, but it was detected in food products all over the globe um, in the first year of the incident. From a regulatory standpoint, there are established standards. Um, these standards are focused primarily on melamine itself. Uh, that's what we have the actual safety data for. It has established TDIs. And the primary point of the regulations was to, to be able to monitor and enforce the potential for melamine adulteration. Um, cyanuric acid is recognized in many of the supporting documents as a mitigating factor, but it's not included with a maximum level and not included in the regulation. When WHO FAO looked at it for codex limits, uh, these limits have been adopted by FDA in the US. It's also been adopted by FSSAI in India. One milligram per kilogram in an infant formula powder and, and that translates to 0.15 milligram per kilogram in a liquid formula. 
but then two and a half milligrams per kilogram in other foods for adults. The, the lower level in infant formula accounts for the higher level of exposure and the fact that infant formula can be the only source of nutrition for an infant. So we really have to be more conservative there. One thing to note is that in the supporting documents and in the discussion at the Codex Committee on Chemical Contaminants in Food, the, the point was made that a level, uh, maximum level in liquid milk needed to be lower than what the level in the finished product infant formula could be. Uh, the liquid milk gets concentrated into powders, and as the liquid is concentrated, the melamine itself gets concentrated. So the proposed level for liquid milk was 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. Um, that's not officially adopted into the codex documents, but it is a good rule of thumb as you're trying to look at the potential for melamine throughout the supply chain in, in milk and milk powder. There are several countries that have a zero tolerance, um, especially in the Southeast Asia region in response to the, melamine, uh, to the China crisis in 2008. Many of the countries there set zero tolerance. They set it at the limit of quantitation for the methods, which was 50 ppb, 0 0.05 milligrams per kilogram. So much lower than what the codex limits are. Um, but they made the point that it was added as an, added as an adulterant and shouldn't be there at all. So they took a zero tolerance standpoint. Um, so it's something to keep in mind um, as you're looking, if you're looking at a global supply chain uh, regulations around the world don't all align the codex. Analytically, this is an AOIC meeting, so we, we can't ignore the analytical aspects of this. From an analytical chemistry standpoint, melamine really changed the way that we look at food and food safety when we're talking about adulteration. Um, Prior to the melamine incident, most methods were based on targeted analysis. We, we had compounds that are regulated, uh, compounds that we, we knew we did not want to be in foods. So you develop a very specific method for that compound in the food matrix and, and you can do the testing. Um, you can get very reliable identification, good quantitation, usually very low detection limits in a targeted method. Uh, the problem is, if somebody is doing food adulteration with something that you aren't aware of, then you'll never see it. So the mass spec methods that are used, the LCMS or GCMS methods um, for melamine, there have been amino assays developed. Um, so there are, there are rapid targeted methods for melamine. The problem becomes what happens if they find a different compound that serves the same purpose. Um, so we always have to be on the lookout for what might be next. Try to think like the food adulteration um, people might think and, and figure out what they might do so that we can stay up front. Um, so there's been a lot of effort on non-targeted methods in the last 10 years. Um, we're looking for things that we might not know are there, but we really need to understand if the food is consistent with what we expect it to be. Um, you do a lot of testing up front to prove that the ingredients in the food is authentic. And then you can do testing to, maintain, to assure that you're maintaining that authenticity over time. These are generally based on universal detection methods, um, spectroscopic methods, maybe NMR. Um, but they give a good way to monitor the food in your supply chain to make sure that everything is still consistent and safe. Um, just one example of, of how things have moved in the last 10 years. Um, because melamine was a high nitrogen compound, um, really we looked at other high nitrogen compounds. And, and when I say we, I mean the analytical community in general, there have been multiple publications of methods similar to this. This is one that was developed in, in our lab uh, chromatogram is, is only five minutes. It's based on UPLC mass spec. Um, it gives very good detection limits and it allows us to look for both melamine and cyanuric acid as well as some other known high nitrogen containing compounds that may end up as food adulterants in the future. So it's just a way to try to predict what might happen. 
uh, somebody could always pick a different compound that's not in this targeted method, and we would still miss it, even though we're trying to incorporate more compounds. Um, so that's just a, a brief overview of the history, why melamine um, is important, but also why cyanuric acid is important. Because melamine continues to appear periodically in the supply chain, if we see it, we have a of cyanuric acid. Um, melamine as an adulterant, uh, we, we need to limit and, and try to get rid of. We don't want the adulterants to be present. But if cyanuric acid is also present, it creates a significant safety issue that we have to immediately take action on to make sure that we're, we're protecting the public. So with that, I'll close. I, I appreciate, again, the opportunity to speak. Um, if there are any questions, uh, please, you can submit by email. I'm sure that they can forward the questions to me. I'll be happy to respond. And I am sorry I couldn't uh, be there in person. Uh, hopefully, in the next year, things will get better, and I'll be able to travel, and I'll be able to meet you then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tom, for your precious time over here. And thank you for explaining us in detail. And uh, I'm, I'm really thankful to all the speakers over here because though we are doing it virtually, but none of you has made it in a short term or something like that. You all have explained it beautifully and in a complete detail. And it's not the end of the session. We have more to come. Uh, the next speaker we have, who have earlier spoken on sections role in strengthening AOAC international activities. Yes, that was Dr. Kaushik Banerjee. And uh, he is the current chairman of the India section of AOAC International. And being a member of the Food Safety Standards Authority of India's scientific panels and working uh, groups on pesticide residues and method of sampling and analysis, he regularly contributes to the development and implementation of food safety standards in India. So with this, I would like to invite again on screen Dr. Kaushik Banerjee, co-chair AOAC Committee of Section. And this time he is coming up again to speak on the case study of melamine, cyanuric acid and DCG in milk and milk products. So can you please have the AVA? Hello, everyone. I hope you are really enjoying today's conference. In this presentation, I will be sharing a brief update on a recent endeavor that AOAC India section has taken up to develop and validate a method for simultaneous analysis of melamine, cyanuric acid, and disandiamide in milk and milk products. A brief note about project background. You all are aware that melamine and cyanuric acid are low mass nitrogen rich compounds that have been linked to protein adulteration in various foodstuffs in the past. So always uh, these came in the media and uh, it created a havoc across the globe uh, about uh, the adulteration and uh, the health hazard that uh, melamine and cyanuric acid had created. While uh, melamine and cyanuric acid are not individually toxic, uh, what happens to that when they come together, they form an adduct and this adduct is formed basically uh, because of hydrogen bonding and the product is melamine cyanurate. Melamine cyanurate uh, produces sharp crystals and uh, it gets deposited in certain internal organs, for example, uh, mainly kidney, and uh, it causes damage of the internal organ or a failure of the organ. And there's a reason uh, the concerned uh, animal uh, dies. A similar compound uh, named uh, disandiamide is also used to minimize the environmental impact of grazing livestock. And it was found in trace amounts in dairy products in New Zealand. So that is the reason why these three compounds that, that is melamine, cyanuric acid and disandiamide are thought always together that uh, whenever we would like to test it in milk and milk products, Probably we need to test all three uh, and the best possible way is to test them simultaneously so that a laboratory throughput can be maintained and the test is uh, basically commercially viable. So here are certain regulatory limits. Uh, the maximum level for melamine in Europe uh, is 2.5 milligram per kilogram. And the same level is also applicable 
in certain other countries. Uh, since uh, melamine, cyanuric acid, disandamide, these are basically food contaminants. So that is the reason the term maximum residue limit is not applicable. It is always called as maximum level. In infant formula, the maximum level is one milligram per kilogram. In Canada, this level is set at 0 0.5 milligram per kilogram. Codex Elementaries Commission, on the other hand, has set a uh, lower limit, which is 0 0.15 milligram per kilogram in liquid infant formula milk, which is also implemented in some countries. So currently in India, we are following the codex standard. Uh, so uh, these contaminants are regulated at this uh, particular level, which is set by codex. Now, if you uh, look at uh, the review of various analytical methods, which uh, targets estimation of melamine, cyanuric acid, uh, uh, and disandamide, you will see that in most cases earlier, uh, the methods uh, targeted uh, two compounds, that is melamine and cyanuric acid. And the reason was obvious because when this issue was brought into the notice uh, of global community. And uh, then uh, it was understood that these two compounds uh, were the major uh, problem created because they combine together from the crystal and that causes damage of kidney. Uh, but uh, since uh, the issue of disandamide was also reported uh, from uh, certain places uh, in milk and milk products. So then it was decided that uh, in every case, the methods were subsequently modified to include disandamide also in the analytical workflow. So in all cases, so one problem is there that these are the small molecules. Uh, they face a lot of trouble in extraction, uh, in chromatographic retention. Uh, so that is the reason uh, in many cases people have reported uh, poor recovery. So to rectify that problem, and correct the recoveries, uh, stable isotope analogs of these three compounds is important uh, to utilize. And it's also important to see that uh, whether uh, chromatographic separation or a longer retention can resolve this. So lots of research and development activities are going on, uh, but fortunately stable isotope analogs for these compounds are currently available uh, for purchase. And uh, when you use it, uh, then it can rectify uh, the, issue of recovery. But uh, on the other hand, uh, these compounds are pretty expensive. So that is the reason uh, activities are also going on uh, to see whether it is possible to avoid uh, use of such isotopically leveled expensive internal standards. So uh, in our laboratory at National Research Center for Grapes, uh, we earlier found that certain plant growth hormones like chromicwort uh, and uh, certain quaternary ammonium compounds, which are small molecules, uh, very polar, uh, and uh, we tried uh, to avoid their isotopically labeled internal standard by uh, using special uh, chromatographic uh, uh, columns, LC columns, uh, and uh, optimizing the gradient program in such a way that uh, the target compound has uh, adequate retention and it uh, eludes at a longer retention time. So in that case, uh, in many cases, we found that uh, we could avoid uh, the high matrix effect because of which people talks about usage of internal standards. So here certain uh, update, uh, if you look at review of literature, uh, the choice of solvent for extraction varies widely. Uh, it's important to precipitate protein. So that is the reason acid is used. Uh, shaking samples with solvent and subsequent centrifugation uh, appears to be a popular practice. That is the general uh, workflow of sample extraction in all cases. The other approaches uh, also include microwave assisted extraction and accelerated solvent extraction. And these are reported by various authors in um, various laboratories across the globe. Uh, regarding cleanup, uh, you see that uh, these compounds have ionic properties. So that is the reason in many cases, the cleanup method has prescribed usage of ion exchange uh, cartridges, especially in solid phase extraction mode. So uh, in literature, we see usage of uh, mixed, mode, mixed mode uh, cation exchange SP and anion exchange uh, SP cartridges for melamine and cyanuric acid analysis. 
but uh, here one problem is there that if you do one uh, process by cation exchanger and another process by anion exchanger and uh, you are basically splitting the extract uh, so in this case uh, you require to undertake separate analysis so that proves to be a uh, little inefficient and uh, uh, not uh, so viable because it takes a longer time so uh, people are trying that how best it is possible to analyze these compounds simultaneously so in recent past uh, most methods uh, that focused on milk and dairy products they either dropped the sp thin up uh, through these ion exchange cartridges or they tried the uh, dispersive solid phase extraction cleanup which is a popular technique for most of the food contaminant analysis because that is easy you just uh, take an adequate of extract add the dispersive solid phase extraction reagent um, vortex and then uh, centrifuge and then uh, the extract uh, whatever supernatant you get that appears to be uh, much cleaner uh, for analysis by uh, same sms uh, lc separation uh, traditionally people tried uh, various phases for example uh, when people tried reverse phase chromatography uh, problem is that uh, these compounds are uh, not having adequate retention uh, many cases they get uh, eluted in the void volume itself so that uh, is a big problem for it, their analysis so uh, people tried various novel stationary phases uh, which has certain functionalities that allows a better retention of such compounds and uh, worldwide uh, analysis of polar compounds ionic compounds is challenging uh, so uh, we love to uh, work on that and uh, basically uh, trying best uh, to improve the retention of the compounds by using various innovative uh, stationary phases and by modifying the mobile phase programs the other options uh, uh, recent past uh, various mixed mode uh, 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 lc columns have come up in the market uh, but uh, this hydrophilic interaction uh, liquid chromatography is appearing most important and most popular because they are specially designed for <clears throat> retention of such compounds and uh, provide adequate retention basically um, uh, that uh, resolves the high matrix effect issue uh, once uh, the compounds are LC separated uh, final measurement is always by tandem mass spectrometry and you know that in food safety these are uh, very adequately defined that whenever you use lcm sms each and every compound should be monitored for two uh, multiple reaction monitoring transitions and ion ratio deviation has to be also monitored and that should not uh, exceed a 30 percent uh, limit uh, when you compare with the standard in uh, matrix so this is the brief outline of the method uh, and also the target outcome of the project so at first uh, we would like to establish the method for simultaneous determination of uh, disandiamide, melamine, and cyanuric acid in milk and milk uh, powder by LCM SMS. Uh, so, uh, both uh, the major matrices will be covered. Uh, the calibration curves uh, are expected to have a linearity between 5 to 200 microgram per liter uh, with a correlation coefficient not less than 0 0.995. Uh, the, these are the recoveries expected uh, as per the standard for all food contaminants. Uh, we should expect a recovery of 70 to 120 percent and uh, relative standard deviation should be quite good so that uh, we have adequate precision in analysis. The limit of quantification uh, as per the current regulatory requirements is expected to be minimum 0 0.02 milligram per kilogram for milk samples and 0 0.05 milligram per kilogram for milk powder samples. The method should be simple, rapid, sensitive, and suitable for qualitative and quantitative analysis of uh, disandiamide, melamine, and cyanuric acid, and in a wide range of milk and dairy product samples. Uh, because uh, unless uh, the method is simple, uh, rapid, uh, and uh, uh, pro probable uh, for uh, regulatory compliance, uh, these will not be accepted. Uh, and uh, a routine testing laboratory expects that the method should not be complicated. The proposed BLOQs are based on the present regulatory requirement. I've already mentioned about that, uh, but uh, there is definite scope uh, to improve the LQs so that in future, 
if uh, there is uh, a change in the regulatory limit, uh, the method should also be applicable. Here, uh, uh, some preliminary data I am showing that we used the UPLC BEH amide column, uh, 1.7 micron particle size. And uh, this is the drag-in program. Uh, uh, we used uh, uh, triple quad LCMS instrument. And uh, here you can see that, that each and every compound has been monitored for two uh, transitions. In certain cases, we can even use three transitions. So basically, these are uh, providing more and more confirmation and uh, high sensitivity analysis. So these optimizations are currently over. Uh, we are getting uh, pretty good signals and uh, we are getting good sensitivity uh, as per the limit of detection. And uh, here uh, I will show this after uh, uh, this slide. So this is the brief sample preparation workflow but to start with or begin with. Uh, this we have taken from this particular uh, reference. So what is done here, at, at first uh, the sample is weighed, uh, approximately one gram of sample is taken in a 50 milliliter of polypropylene tube, uh, internal standards are added here, uh, then uh, water with uh, formic acid, stainable water containing 0.1% formic acid is added, uh, then uh, it is shaken, then homogenized uh, appropriately, uh, then uh, it's uh, centrifuged uh, to from after centrifugation. Uh, an aliquot is taken. This uh, aliquot uh, is uh, diluted with uh, 9 ml of uh, acetonitrile and again shaken. Uh, then uh, from this uh, you take uh, the aliquot. This is uh, subjected to cleanup using primary secondary amine and C18 solvents by dispersive solid phase extraction cleanup. So you have to basically ex take the extract, uh, put it into some uh, uh, tubes and add uh, these uh, weight quantity of uh, the dispersive solid phase extraction solvents. So after uh, vortexing centrifugation, uh, the aliquot appears to be quite clear. Uh, that uh, this clear supernatant is uh, drawn and injected into LCM SMS for uh, analysis. And here I have already mentioned that a BH amide column provided a very good. Uh, uh, method performance, but we are uh, still trying various other options. So here you can see the chromatographic performance. Uh, uh, the first signal is for disandiamide. Uh, it is followed by melamine and then uh, cyanuric acid. So this is the elution pattern. Uh, and uh, so this chromatography clearly says that uh, all three compounds could be estimated uh, simultaneously. We have set currently a runtime of 10 minutes. Uh, so in this 10 minute program, uh, each and every compound are separated chromatographically and they are appearing uh, at, uh, uh, appearing uh, in sequence of, uh, I think, disandamide, then melamine, and then cyanuric, then cyanuric acid. And the last signal is uh, melamine. So. Uh, uh, these are the chromatograms in uh, solvent. Uh, DCD signal comes at uh, 1.22 minute. This is followed by cyanuric acid, 2.38 minute, and then melamine at 4.52, uh, 4.62 minute. And uh, here uh, you can see the chromatograms in milk matrix. So we could achieve recovery more than 80%. Uh, when you use a solvent standard because of high matrix effect, uh, the recovery is uh, not consistent. In certain compounds, uh, recoveries are a bit poor. Uh, but uh, what we found that uh, although recovery was poor, uh, it was consistent. But uh, uh, here, uh, when we used uh, the matrix mass standard, the recovery could be corrected to a great extent. But still, we are facing certain problems of uh, inconsistency. So we are uh, also going to use internal standard in this and uh, trying to optimize the method in such a way so that it is uh, acceptable and uh, implementable across various uh, laboratories of, uh, of regulatory agencies. So these are the next steps. Uh, we will further optimize the method, as I mentioned, uh, by using internal standards, by optimizing the chromatography mode, uh, using uh, different columns, different chromatographic separation uh, possibilities. 
uh, we will follow the Sante guideline for further experiment uh, regarding analytical method performance. So as per the guideline, the final method will be evaluated for its precision, uh, sensitivity, linearity, accuracy, matrix effect, and uh, all other aspects. The accuracy of the method will be studied at a minimum three level. Uh, LOQ is the compulsory uh, requirement. Then at least two high levels, uh, we should uh, check the recovery and the precision. Uh, a minimum six replicate study will be conducted. And we are expecting to complete the SLB study in the next uh, couple of months. So I think it's a steady progress. And uh, we hope that uh, India section uh, will uh, be successful in completing this study uh, well uh, within the uh, time uh, stipulated time period. So uh, this is uh, a brief uh, outline of uh, today's talk. Uh, this is one of the activities which uh, India section is taking, uh, taking up. Uh, in addition to that, India section is also doing uh, one uh, study on multi-element analysis. Uh, this uh, study, SLB, is already completed. This uh, SLB study has already been communicated by uh, the authors to Journal of AOS International. It is currently under review. And uh, India section has initiated uh, the multi-lab study on that multi-element uh, method. So that will also come up very soon. And then these will be implemented and uh, these will be prescribed to FSSA for implementation through the regulatory process and uh, inclusion in the FSSA concern manual. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kaushik Banerjee for sharing your views and for explaining in detail uh, for the amazing case study session thank you so much and next we are moving towards the next part that is uh, with message from a stakeholder and we have mr rajesh girdhar with us over here mr rajesh kumar girdhar is currently working with abort nutrition as head of india r d where he is india lead for new product introduction and developing innovation pipeline his core expertise is analytical chemistry and microbiology he has more than 25 years of experience working closely with India analytical landscape in all domains. He is speaking as AOAC stakeholder, and you will hear more about him and his views. Can you please have the AV? Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. It's great to be on this platform. My name is Rajesh Girdar. I feel highly honored and obliged to talk to you as a stakeholder representing industry. Let me first quickly introduce myself. I work with Abbott Nutrition as head of India R&D, total experience of uh, 28 years in this sector. Previously worked for uh, PepsiCo, Nestle and Biomario. And by training, I'm a microbiologist. I did my five-year degree in microbiology from uh, Honor School, Punjab University. I'm very proudly aff affiliated with the NABL as a lead assessor for the last uh, 15 years or so. And equally proud to say that I'm associated with the India section of AOC International since its creation in 2011. So, uh, you see here AOC India journey, the chapter was formed in 2011, the first meeting happened in 2012, it was in Mumbai, and I recall there was only one international uh, delegate present uh, in this meeting, and he was Mr. Wayne Vargo from uh, Habit itself, yeah, he was representing uh, AOC International. And uh, from there onward, uh, with the association for um, industry and equipment manufacturers, and um, you know, with the inclusion of Dr. Kaushik uh, Banerjee, I think this uh, the section actually uh, started taking the shape where, where we can proudly say today it is now. A uh, lot of support came from uh, CROs, universities, and um, um, the regulator side was uh, you know. Um, big support from FSSAI, EIC, and um, you know, lot, lot many um, you know people in the list. Actually, it's a long list. They came into uh, 
picture industry was a very very uh, you know sportive and a lot of uh, associations actually came into uh, sport of AFC India chapter and the strategical uh, move uh, set up by Dr. Kaushik, Dr. Ranjan Mitra and um, Shreen was now we can certainly say that uh, you know this chapter is in towards a uh, you know uh, excellence at this stage. <clears throat> the purpose of uh, this section is um, uh, very clear. The primary outcome and uh, secondary outcome, which have been uh, mentioned here, you know, those all have been uh, very nicely met. So, how this chapter is performing at uh, uh, international platform? That is very interesting to know. Um, I have been witness to uh, the recognition India section is getting at uh, annual meetings of AOC International. At least for five years, I've seen uh, the way uh, India section is now being recognized, the way it is being benchmarked and being appreciated. You know, certainly my colleagues from uh, you know other industries, um, they will agree that India section is considered to be the most uh, mature section. You know when we benchmark against, uh, you know, other section, at least X US sections, you know, this is one of the best uh, recognized section. Mm -hmm. Just some pictures here at the bottom, you can see the section meetings picture where all the sections um, uh, were present. They, they share the learnings. So this meeting picture from Dallas, then annual meeting Toronto. And uh, the last one is on uh, closing reception at Atlanta. You know, you can see there is a band on the back and the people probably they're dancing. So this was the last, uh, you know, face to face uh, meeting Atlanta, Colorado, you know, um, which was in 2019. <clears throat> so what is AOC's approach towards the stakeholders? So AOC has laid a certain set of values, which they always try to abide by. So those five values are uh, listed here, purposeful, relevant, open and honest, inclusive, responsive. So, um, you know, as an industry stakeholder working closely with the uh, India section for last uh, nine or 10 years, I can, I can clearly endorse that, that India section has not only inculcated these values, but has really demonstrated, you know, at all uh, points of, uh, you know, time, you know, without fail. So that's great to, uh, be, um, you know, seeing that that values actually um, are, uh, you know, executed flawless in India section. So what as a stakeholder, as industry stakeholder, what are my expectations from AOC India that I also like to mention here. So there are three key uh, expectations. The first one is the method development. Of course, that is a core activity. So how a new method is adopted, you know, as such from inter international methodology, how we can um, actually uh, get into the local system. And if there is a need to tweak it a bit, so how we can do a little um, more uh, verification or validation to make it robust for, uh, you know, local needs. <clears throat> that, part in, that part is being really addressed well. The second expectation is the capacity building. It's more of a strategic in nature. Um, where I believe uh, there is a lot of support uh, USC India is getting from uh, FSSCI and also equipment manufacturers and industry stakeholders are really putting all their efforts to create a talent pool, you know, in the fields of uh, chemistry and microbiology. The third one is which I personally feel is a, you know, very important, you know, scientific leadership. It's a vision, uh, it's visionary type of expectation, you know, where, uh, I, I feel and I, I, I know everyone will also agree to that, that in India, we have a lot of, uh, you know, scientific talent pool, you know, India being little diverse. We need to identify those, uh, you know, talents, bring them to, uh, to uh, you know, AOC India platforms, align them with what we really look forward to. And ultimately, those talents will be, uh, you know, contributing uh, to the global initiatives and bring a name to, uh, you know, India. That is what I, I expect. It will take some time, I know, but yeah, certainly in coming years, uh, this will be a you know, good focus area, should be a good focus area. So this is one example. This is a case study, uh, how, uh, how an international method can be adopted should be adopted and how this practice is actually being implemented. So 
we did a single laboratory validation with AOAC 201506 method. This method is on uh, 12 elements analysis using, uh, uh, you know, one run, you can get all uh, 12 elements in one go. So this method is for infant formula and adult nutrition. In India, you know, uh, infant formula is under mandatory product certification, which is a Bureau for Indian Standards. The purpose was to extend the existing uh, methodology, which is uh, based on 201506, to verify that how much it is, uh, you know, fitting into the purpose. So Dr. Joe Thompson, who is a, a original author of this method, he was uh, he aligned to provide the technical guidance. And it's very fast uh, methodology, as I already explained. What was the need for this single laboratory validation? Because in India, uh, we also use malt and cereal along with the milk and soya. So there was a need uh, um, aligned, agreed that we should be uh, doing a you know, single laboratory validation followed by multi-laboratory testing to set the you know, fitness of this method. So what we did, we, we worked with a, with a third party laboratory in Hyderabad under uh, you know, continuous uh, guidance uh, from AUAC and also from a method expert, Dr. Joe Thompson. And uh, with a good intervention, you know, three to six months it takes, uh, you know, to set up the method and do the validation work. So that was done and all uh, standard method performance requirements were set, accuracy uh, standards were met and, uh, you know, validation was complete. So the key next steps are actually AOC publication, which is almost due. And the next step is now to represent it to a method review group and get it certified uh, for analysis in infant and adult nutrition products where I believe AVC India is working closely uh, with method mm -hmm. To sum up, AVC India chapter is helping and strengthening a robust and analytical ecosystem in the country. So um, I, I can say, you know, everyone is supporting um, that initiative and being very well supported by um, FSSCI and we are very good on that. And uh, AOC is also uh, being uh, instrumental in developing a practical talent pool by conducting seminars, webinars, hands-on training, and, uh, and that is creating a great uh, talent pool that, that that would be seen in next coming years. The results would be seen very positively in the next few years, certainly. And also one expectation, uh, you know, where we already have started working, that um, you know we identify that analytical talent pool uh, and see. Mm -hmm how uh, better we can use that, you know, at the national platforms and uh, how they can contribute in the coming years on the global initiatives. Okay. With that, i like to thank uh, AAC India once again for giving this opportunity and uh, I wish them all the very best. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rajesh Kizarji, for uh, being with us and explaining what are the minute details. Thank you again. And now, uh, moving on to the summary and conclusions of this virtual conference meet. And for this, I would like to invite on screen Dr. Saurabh Arora, Treasurer AOAC India section. Uh, he is heading the contract testing and research business at Agro and Origa since 2005. In this capacity, he has designed and set up six state-of-the-art testing laboratories in New Delhi, Manesar, Badi, and Bangalore. He is currently leading a team of over 400 scientists and professionals who work in these laboratories, which serve clients in the food, retail, hospitality, nutraceutical, pharmaceutical, cosmetics, agri, medical device, research, academics, and infrastructure industries. He holds a doctorate in pharmaceutics from Jamia Hamdard University and master's in pharmaceutical technology from the National Institute for Pharmaceutical Education and Research. He has invented, patented, and commercialized nanotechnology-based delivery system for curcumin, that is SNEC30, the active constituent of turmeric, that is haldi, he is currently the treasurer of India section of AOAC International and has authored numerous articles, studies and research reports for national and international journals and magazines. He has a passion for sharing and spreading knowledge. For this, he founded and established the Food Safety Helpline, which helps 
the food industry stay up to date and understand and implement the requirements of the Food Safety and Standards Act 2006. He also founded labtraining.com, an e-learning platform for professionals and aspiring students, which not only helps students to learn practical aspects of analytical techniques, but also aids the professionals with the fundamental understanding of working in a laboratory and the associated processes, systems, and procedures. And hereby, I welcome you, Dr. Sorabharara, over here. Good evening and welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, it has been a wonderful session and uh, we, we've had very good attendance since morning. Uh, this is a very, very important topic and often we see that actually authenticity and safety aspect, uh, you know, specifically related to adulteration and authenticity is often overlooked. And most events are focusing on uh, uh, hardcore uh, safety in terms of pesticides, metals, you know, the uh, hardcore safety parameters that are there. But these uh, uh, authenticity and adulteration, the food safety related aspect is equally important. Uh, often when we are, uh, you know, in the laboratory and uh, uh, talking to the senior people who have worked during the PFA regimen and now transition into the FSSAI. So what we do see there is that uh, PFA was, uh, you know, the regulations were totally focused on adulteration and more on the economically motivated adulteration and all the tests and everything was focused there because at that time there was simple adulteration, you know ranging from things like uh, putting sand in salt, adding, uh, you know, pieces of stone into rice and uh, a lot of use of artificial colorants to enhance the values. So from there, the sophistication level of the authenticity challenges that the regulators and the labs and all the stakeholders are facing has really changed. So along with the changes in the challenges, uh, uh, we have seen that FSSAI has also adapted itself and we have these new regulations coming in. Uh, honey being the prime example which was discussed extensively today where we are now not only looking at simple adulteration but also talking about uh, the origin whether it is monoplural or not. So, uh, you know, it was a very interesting session and I hope everybody has really enjoyed it. And I would now like to thank all the speakers uh, for their contribution. Uh, starting with uh, uh, Shri Arun Singhal, the CEO of FSSAI, uh, under whose uh, dynamic leadership now, you know, FSSAI is continuing its uh, all initiatives and working hard. And uh, with his talk, he really did set the mood for today's uh, uh, deliberations because he so simply defined and explained what really food authenticity and food safety and uh, is and what are the challenges really that we are facing and how FSSAI is navigating this. I thank sir for his words. After that, Mr. Srinivas Joshi uh, gave a wonderful insight into the activities of uh, AOC India and as our president, uh, he is you know really pushing and working very hard. I must share with you personally that even uh, both of us are talking maybe four times a day and all the team, executive committee, you know, everybody right from uh, Kaushik sir, Srinivas, Vishal, Ganesh, everybody on the team is uh, you know working very hard so uh, i think shrinivas uh, very nicely summarized the outcome of the hard work of the entire team uh, then uh, we had dr pamal onandi who is uh, you know uh, brought in front the complexity of the food uh, supply chain and also some startling numbers i was really surprised that there are 163 potential adulterants in milk so that really you know brings uh, to light the analytical challenge that we are really facing. So as labs, regulators, uh, uh, you know, industry, uh, we really need to keep on updating our approaches and methods uh, to, you know, really fight these uh, challenges. And the uh, AOAC is rightly working in this and, you know, it shows how proactive AOAC International really is that uh, with these challenges in, uh, you know, increasing day by day, <coughs> Uh, 2019, the economically motivated adult trend uh, you know, uh, methods uh, were started to be worked on and we have uh, methods already in the pipeline there. Uh, after that, we had Ms. Uh, Peggy Monson who uh, you know, very nicely uh, talked about uh, the SPFAN initiative and uh, SPFAN is a wonderful example. I have uh, been fortunate to sit on some of the 
uh, you know, listen into the uh, expert review panels and the process, uh, you know, uh, the SPFAN has really shown that the SMPR and development the system has really brought so much of speed and a better quality into the process through which AOAC is really developing the methods. And it is no uh, you know, uh, small task to have 15 uh, final action methods and more than 17 more methods already in the pipeline in such a short uh, span of time. So uh, that is uh, was a wonderful uh, you know, thing to see into and also understand more what Abbott is doing uh, globally and in India to support the method development initiatives. Uh, after that, uh, Kaushik Banerjee, sir, in his uh, uh, capacity as the so sorry, in his capacity as the uh, uh, chair for the sections committee, uh, shared the, really the vision of AOC International for the uh, international uh, sections which are there and how they are expecting them to con uh, contribute. I just think you uh, So and I was happy to. See Dr. Manerjee really highlighting all the work which has been done at the AOC India section and what other sections are doing as well. Uh, then we had uh, Chris Elliott, Dr. Chris Elliott, uh, another really uh, intriguing talk. I uh, was really fascinated by the uh, concept of the eye knife and how they are using it and something which can give you results in seconds and that depth of results, you know, where you are able to uh, look at the identity, origin, even the way the fish has been caught, you know, something uh, that much of information uh, for us to be able to pick up. I got fascinated and I think everybody must have uh, googled uh, chemometrics and uh, started thinking of how we will be able to uh, use this in our labs. Uh, because I think chemometrics and uh, these advanced techniques are definitely going to be very much required and uh, capacity building and understanding on these aspects is really important as we move and talk more about uh, food authenticity. Uh, then we had a talk from uh, Dr. Lalita uh, in which she uh, very uh, in detail shared with us about honey, uh, you know, the different types of honey, different sources, how it is processed and uh, uh, covering the isotope ratio of mass spectrometry, uh, which we know but at the same time also talking about very interesting things like sugar profiling, free, free amino acid uh, profiling, conductivity and the chemometrics uh, uh, you know, methods which can be applied on these to get the origin and authenticity of honey. So that was also a real eye opener because for me at least uh, when I think of it honey was usually just limited to FG ratios, HMF, chemical parameters and the IRMS. Uh, but knowing that there are other techniques also which can be explored uh, for the origin and authenticity, it was a really wonderful talk going into them. Uh, then I thank Dr. Bhaskar. Uh, he's always uh, wonderful uh, talks that he has and uh, they bring such deep insight into the topics. And the best thing is that when you get these deep insights from him, it is presented in a simple way which will stick in your mind and that's what sir did this case also showing so many wonderful examples and giving us some actionable acronyms like uh, DART, DNA and REST and how we can really look at the future of uh, ensuring the authenticity of the fish and the controlling the uh, economically motivated uh, penetration which is happening there potentially and I think this is some area where we don't have any data uh, for India. So it would be of great interest to really understand the, the real financial implications and what is happening by implementing these things. Uh, then I thank Dr. Uh, Mai. Uh, she was uh, uh, gave a very good overview of the economically uh, motivated iteration over the last 50 years. So you know, usually when we talk about food authenticity, we are stuck at uh, 2008 uh, and we all start from melamine. But it was really nice to understand how it started uh, way back and has been there for a long time. And also she really highlighted the impact in terms of uh, you know the huge number of people who are uh, exposed to this fraud. Uh, you know, the 600 million people, you know, uh, so it's a huge number, 1 in 10 in the world being exposed and the 420,000 deaths, you know, that's a very worrying number. 
and it really highlights again to all of us really the importance of the entire uh, you know activity of identifying and controlling the food frauds uh, after that we had a talk from dr simon and uh, i always love listening to him uh, on how clearly and uh, you know in a step by step fashion he presents how the regulatory framework should be laid out how the investments need to be made and uh, you know uh, what all needs to be done from investments into generating the data doing the risk assessments capacity building and a very holistic approach towards uh, regulating and ensuring the food safety so i thank dr simon uh, for that wonderful uh, coverage and after this uh, we took a deep dive into the ongoing uh, uh, slv work and uh, the melamine cyanuric acid work which is going on with uh, the tremendous support support from the entire abbot team uh, you will be surprised to know we talk every uh, second week for a couple of hours on this method sharing the updates and we fortunate to have tom on these calls with rajesh and sandeep and the entire team so tom uh, very nicely covered the history of the melamine and also how the toxicity came up how cyanuric acid is involved in it i used to uh, uh, i am sorry for my ignorance but i used to sometimes think cyanuric acid is actually maybe a by product of melamine but uh, that's where you know it, the importance of really understanding the origin of the whole thing is very important so that was very nicely presented by him after that we had uh, dr kaushik banerji covering the details of the method development and the single lab validation which is going on in his lab uh, with support from abbot so uh, he covered in depth the different approaches th that are there in literature as well as what the lab is trying and also highlighting the financial aspects also you know the economical aspects of method development are also very important uh, we can go ahead and have uh, very good uh, you know methods but if they're too expensive having high hello yeah i hope that thanks to that so that was the way nicely covered along with the practical details of all the work which has been done in the lab on the method and we are quite hopeful that in next 4 to 6 weeks this may work will get uh, covered up lastly we had uh, rajesh kirdar thank you so much uh, you know rajesh ji always holds us as aoac to a very high standard holds us accountable and also in terms of his expectations of methods capacity building and all he is very clear on that so he very nicely covered that and i think he gave the best explanation on the entire uh, you know activities and the recognition which the hard work of the entire team of aosc india section is getting um, you know by sharing his inputs on how people are responding globally during the aosc international meeting and the work we are doing together so i thank you so much rajesh ji and we assure you we will live up to your expectations and the together uh, because you are a equally important uh, stakeholder everybody academia uh, the regulators the fssci uh, the instrument suppliers uh, you know uh, labs like us industry all of us are playing our role and working together to make aosc and all our events and all our working successful and i'm sure you all must also be noticing that we have graduated and are doing much more technical and concrete work over the years so i thank you all so much for your support and for being here with us and i uh, back to the team thank you so much thank you sir uh, thank you so much for being with us and this was dr saurabh arora and uh, it was uh, eventually a very great session sir and jo, though we are going through a covid uh, thing and thanks to this internet and media that i hope it all went really well thank you so much to the team uh, behind the scenes our team maestro uh, always supporting us and doing all the hard work behind the scenes thank you so much thank you for to everybody who attended we have actually had more than 200 people go to the event today and uh, thank you so much uh, please feel free to keep sharing your questions we'll try and have most of them answered thank you sir thank you for being with us
and uh, this was AOAC International India section presents virtual conference meet on food authenticity and food safety conference and once again I'm really thankful to all the speakers from globally around the world and all the viewers those who are with us since like last five hours you are continuously watching us and being with us putting all the questions up thank you if you have any questions you can drop it down in the comment section and with this I'm uh, really thankful to uh, FSSAI, that is our event supporter, that is even supported by FSSAI, and our technical partner abroad. And uh, this event is managed by Milestone Event Management Limited. And I was your host of uh, this conference, Anka Kiran Maswani. It was lovely having you all here. And thank you so much globally around. A big thanks to all the speakers once again and all the viewers who has joined us globally around. Thank you so much.